We're, we're going to start because we. I just learned that our witness has another engagement at, at ten to at ten to ten. Um, Jessica, would you would you would you want to make the introduction? Sure. So, oh, perfect. Here's our chair. <laughs> so Jessica, we're just we're Go just ahead. about make to introduce the Oh, good. So, I have asked um, Adam Bunting to come today to talk to us a little bit about the work that he's doing at CBU. He's the principal of the Champlain Valley Union High School. And he's also principal of the year, so today on the floor, that also will be noted. Um, and he's here to talk a bit about the survey that he's been doing at the school that really helps with prevention in that you can hopefully start to see um, who might be at risk ahead of time, which would be really nice if we could all do be better about that because it would prevent maybe a lot of big problems in the road. So Adam, if you would join us. Sure. <laughs> I'll trip on my own bag first. <laughs> Sitting, standing, does it matter? I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting. We have a thing about sitting. What's that? We have a thing about sitting. A thing thing about sitting, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you just want to take one of those and pass it on. So I do want to just, um, it's a, it would be a little bit awkward for me to be correcting Jessica to start. Um, <laughs> because I so appreciate her support. Uh, I think we might need a couple more copies. Uh, one more. One more? Oh, go. <coughs> I'm just going to read that. There we go. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is we are talking about students uh, or young people who, who are at risk. But to support students who are at risk, you have to a, a, approach uh, approach those students in a, in a bit of a counterintuitive way. And that is, we, we all get so concerned um, about our populations of, of students who uh, might be predisposed to violence or predisposed to use. But we have to focus on strengths. And we have to focus on belonging. And we have to focus on community. And most importantly, in my mind, we have to focus on engagement to actually make a difference for our kids. And that, that's about prevention. But at working with Jolinda and the, the Opioid Coordination Council, that's also about intervention. That's also about recovery. To me, the physics of human wellness transcend all of those ways in which we try to parse out our approach to things like the opioid crisis or school violence. I think it makes it easier for us when we talk about it to break it into two, um, to little, you know, kind of concrete silos, but but the reality is, um, we have we have to have a similar approach when we think about these things. So, the fact that I'm presenting data and surveys is uh, uh, slightly ironic. I'm truly an English teacher at heart. <laughs> People typically don't walk away from me and say, "Man, that guy knows a lot about data." Um, <laughs> they, they might be able to write a poem about data, um, <laughs> but but. Uh, over the past two years, my learning about data has been transformative in my leadership at CBU and transformative for our community. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And our data story starts with one, one student uh, a couple of years ago who uh, joined us in the fall. And I'm just going to give you a very abridged version. And Joe Linda is very sick of hearing the story, I'm sure. Uh, but I met this young man in September. He had come to us, like many of our students from around the state, who kind of go from high school to high school to high school. For the, I'm sure you are well versed in adverse childhood experiences and trauma. He's a student who had lots of ACEs. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure the student was under the influence when I first met him. And within about a day of being at CBO, he'd gotten in a fight. A lot happened over that year for him. And I was, very, I was just genuinely worried about him from the first minute I met him. I'm just going to fast forward you all the way to June when I was working out in the weight room at CBU after school on a treadmill. And I turned my head and realized that this young man was on a treadmill next to me. Not only was he not under the influence, not only had he become involved in school, uh, but he had, he'd be also become involved in, in academics and become a real part of our community. So we got off the treadmill and I turned to him. And I said, I said, Jared, this is like unbelievable. Think about who you were at the beginning of this year and now. 
And he said two things to me that, that stuck. He said, I didn't know I could be this person. Uh, and he said, I didn't know life could be this easy. And he was referencing making good choices. And I mean, a lot had changed for him in that year. But I began to think about the power of our communities to help our individuals transform, and then in turn, the power of those individuals to transform our communities, which you'll see by the survey is he has gone, actually. So, so I had Jared in my mind as we're talking about the shootings at Parkland, and we're talking about the opioid crisis, and we're talking about trauma. And it was interesting for me to, to look around our state and see, and in our educational community, and see how reactive we were all being. And I, and I felt like, and I was being reactive too, but I felt like some of the measures that we were taking actually were inhibiting our ability to engage students and to build relationships instead of helping them. And just like with Jared, we as a school began to realize that Building a healthy community begins with an invitation to kids on an individual level to become part of the community. So we have this idea. So we looked at, if you look at slide two, or page two over here, we began looking at the 40 developmental assets. This is pretty old research, uh, but basically the assets describe characteristics that young people have, advantages that young people have. Um, personality traits maybe even that young people have that uh, give them a higher chance of thriving in adulthood. And they're pretty simple. Like, I have an adult with, I have a connection with one adult in the building. I'm engaged in extracurricular activities three hours a week. So we looked at these 40 developmental assets and as a school said, what can we control? Right? We can, we can sit here and whine about the state of the world and our concern about anxiety, or we can say, we're going to make an impact. And so we, we built a survey on uh, probably about 10 of the developmental assets that we thought we could really control. And we also, if you just slide over to, to page five here, decided that you get a lot. You, you do get some good stuff out of the youth, youth risk behavior survey. I don't want to deride it, but getting information back a year and a half later usually isn't all that helpful. You'll see the most recent youth risk behavior survey says we don't have a problem with vaping. <laughs> we do, <laughs> but that's just because the information is a year and a half old, um, and it's also anonymous, which is to me a problem. So we gave a non-anonymous survey uh, to all of our students. And you'll see on page five, we also asked at the end of the survey, would students have responded differently if it had been anonymous? And you can see 22% said maybe, 71% said no. In fact, when we first gave out the survey, we sent out the blank over email. I had a student respond to it who had dropped out a month earlier. To me, that was a strong indication that our young people, we all, we want to be known. We want to be connected. <clears throat> so if you jump over to page seven, this is what we lovingly call our heat map. And you can see the darker the color, the greater indication, the, or the, number, the, the greater number of students who have responded uh, to a particular, to a particular uh, response in the Likert scale. So from strongly agree all the way on the right, to strongly disagree on the left. Some really interesting things pop out. And you can see the questions on the left. There's some of the questions in the survey. They've got one adult. They have friends at school. Their friend group is supportive and tolerant. They have, they're interested in their classes. Life feels satisfying and manageable. We'll come back to that one, and so forth. And I'm going to give you a second to just peruse this data. So the first time we gave out the survey, it was too much data for me to look at as a principal. And uh, admittedly, it was about a month before I got to looking at the data, which is, uh, I regret because it's a little bit dangerous to do that because students may disclose something. We had all of our, we had all of our advisors look at this survey because we have students broken into advisors. So they have one 
every 12 students, we have one advisor who connects with them daily. It's almost like a homeroom. But when I looked at the survey later, and I was able to isolate uh, sort of groups of students who we were worried about based on the results of the survey, I realized that these questions had actually become predictive. So students who were at risk of, of dropping out of school or students who had gotten in trouble uh, from just from the survey to uh, when I looked at the data, their names were appearing again and again as having answered honestly to things like, I, I don't have friends at school or I'm not interested in my classes and all of a sudden, or I don't have a connection with an adult, right? You can see the top of this, eight students strongly disagreed with that. Well, I know who those students are now, right? I can go and talk to them. I can go meet with them. And, um, and they appreciate that. Uh, we also, you know, we, we also wanted to make sure, we, we gave the survey out to the student's parents and to their advisor. So all of a sudden, you can see discrepancy between what the student is perceiving in their life and what the parents are perceiving and what their teachers are perceiving. And that discrepancy becomes really important. Another fascinating little flip of this was we had students write down the names of the adults in their lives who they're connected to. Really interesting to be like, wow, uh, Ron Fleming, if you ever get that he's a phenomenal human being, he works at our school. I'm like, Why are 400 people saying Ron Fleming is their go-to adult? <laughs> And does he know that? And what is he doing? Um, Probably it's a good reason. It's a great reason. <laughs> it's a great reason. <laughs> um, and then we could also, uh, for a couple teachers I talked to, I said, hey, this person listed you as someone who you know, you're important to. And they said, they did? And their relationship with that young person changes, mm -hmm. right? But then we as a full faculty could say, hey, these eight students aren't feeling connected in three or four of these areas. What do we do about it? And the faculty said, every time I saw that kid in the hall, I walked down and made eye contact with him and smiled. So those simple things, I mean, we're, we're always looking for a specific pro program or a panacea. You know, we're trying to solve our problems. We have got to come back to some of these simple human connections around belonging, again, engagement, uh, you know, unconditional positive regard. Also, we, but if you don't ask, you don't know. So I'll, 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 I want to get you to ask questions in a minute. But so there was so much data. I actually I reached out to a friend of mine named Brian Lloyd Newberry, who works at Dealer.com, and I said, "Help! I need. I'm not a data guy. Um, we also need this to turn around instantaneously." So Brian and a couple of other people said, "He's like, well, Dealer.com, we help car dealerships build." Um, uh, dashboards so they can have more effective relationships and connections and formed relationships with their with their clients. Why wouldn't we use that same technology in schools? Uh, so we, we spent this past year building an app. It's pretty interesting to work with with Brian because uh, his hours are very different than mine. <laughs> we we'll be able to, like 3 a.m. like, give me the damn survey, Brian. You know, like, this, is what, this is what software engineers do. Like, okay, you're freaking me out. Um, <laughs> But he did this all on his own time, you know, uh, for free. Uh, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. He put in hundreds of hours at this so that we, you know, so then now that when we give out the survey, we have instantaneous results, both like that we can see the school wide, but we can disaggregate this data in really interest, interesting ways. Uh, you know, I, I actually look at the bottom of this survey when you see it shift to the left or the more negative side where the neutrals are more heavily uh, darkly colored. That's Act 77 stuff right there. That's proficiency stuff right there. That's personalization. We need to do a better job of uh, offering choice, voice, autonomy, mastery within our schools. Um, and that's for the House Ag Committee. But, uh, and then the, the last thing for me, uh, if you look at page six here, one of the questions we ask is, is life outside of school, does it, is it sad, does it feel satisfying and manageable? So our strongly disagrees and disagrees aren't too bad, but when you look at the neutral response to that, the fact that we're, you know, that, that the neutral to the strongly disagree is almost, is around 200 and something kids, uh, that to me says something. And it can be as simple as, I met one of my, my advisees who strongly disagreed, I said, what's going on? Why are you feeling that way? You know, what's, 
talk to me about it. And his mom was there, and we were having this connection. And he was like, well, I'm involved in 4-H, I'm involved in this, I'm milking, milking the cows at 3 in the morning, and then I'm coming to school, and I've got these... You know, but for him, it was still feeling unmanageable. So you can have that response. You can also have the response of, I don't feel safe at home. Uh, the response of my, my mom and dad are, um, you know, uh, struggling with, with addiction. Um, we've had all of that come out of just simply asking. For me, it comes down to, when I became an assistant principal, I, I began to get better at recognizing, particularly when our young males wanted to talk, they would show up to my office and just hang out <laughs> and hover, <laughs> right? And, and so I, after a while, Don and me like, oh, they want me to ask them what's going on and how they're doing today so they can talk about it. But they need that, they need that invitation. So, uh, so this is, has really changed. We, we also, we looked at the last thing, I keep saying the last thing, but it's not the last thing to get passionate. I'm excited about this. Um, uh, do I have a voice in school? You'll see students are not feeling like they do, as strong as they might have relationships. What we realize is they have a voice, but they aren't, they aren't seeing where their ideas are going and how their ideas are actually changing school. So we had a discussion with kids about starting a student congress, which we're going to pilot this spring. So we have 120 advisors in the school. One kid from every advisory is going to be a representative of that advisory and come together and start looking at uh, school-wide change and. So that, that should be good, but it's different than, say, what the uh, uh, you know, student council that we're used to, where you're elected by your peers. So this is yeah, you know, more of an equal, equal voice. So. so I'll stop there. I'll let you ask questions if you have any. You can also poke through the data here. There's some pretty interesting stuff. I have not shared. This is the, the data we gathered just uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, so I have not shared. <coughs> The full full list of my student with my faculty. So if you just want to keep this to yourselves if you can, that's great. The last thing I'll the last, 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 last thing, if you get as you get to page 16 and 17, you'll see student A and student and student B over these pages. What's on the left is our proficiency report. So these are our graduation standards. On the right is the SBAC testing that we do. So all of a sudden, you can start triangulating information. So you can look at our proficiency data in our school, student voice, some standardized testing, and then you've got a more holistic view of a student so that you can really look at some of their strengths. Quick example, our, that student who I was talking about was milking cows. I think some people's in, initial response would be like, all right, well, that, like, that's your passion. Let's get you, in, let's get you into the tech program. Let's sit in that. But when, when I started looking at his proficiency scores and standardized tests, his reading and writing's off the charts, right? So while I think, I think actually technical education makes sense for him, you better not be stereotyping that kid, right? Because he is, we, we have got open doors. Um, so, and, and this is how some of the proficiency work, that, and Act 77 has made a huge difference for us in that, in that push to graduate based on meaningful standards versus APs, Cs, and Ds. I did want to let you know, if you do not know, Representative Lippert, who chairs House Health Care, he is from Heinsburg. He oh. came to listen in. Um, he represents I to listen in. I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Okay, I don't um, think I would attract anything yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I am curious in terms of when you get this data and you um, and the school wraps around the student in some way. Um, what is, when do you reach out? When do you reach out and what are those challenges and um, as well as strengths in terms of reaching out to after school activities, to, um, you know, to mental health and substance use counselors, to yeah. fill in the blank? Well, we are, we're blessed at CBU, and I have to remember that Chittenden County has some resources that other places across the state don't. Uh, so we have a pretty uh, hearty, hearty system and, and lots of opportunities for students to engage, uh, both in outside of schools. But, but it comes down to that primary structure of advisory for me. So my, I have 12 advisees right now from four, the four different you know, nine through 12. And that group of students I meet with every day. So I'm a gatekeeper for those kids. So when I immediately look, I can look at their, I like, you know, the, the survey data is instantaneous. So I can look at them and see their responses. And I'm the first discussion. 
Uh, and we also have our, our personalized learning plans. We have our PLP meetings with parents. So parents come in and meet with me and the students. So it begins there with that nu nucleus. The nice thing about what Brian built is that uh, we can look at our, you know, we don't have the right word for it yet, but it's like, we don't want to say students concerned because that doesn't feel right, but loosely the kids were worried about based on their responses. Mm -hmm. Immediately it goes to their school counselors as well because their school counselors have a, a, a page that they can look at uh, that is populated with based on kind of the responses that, that we care most about. Um, so that's that's really where we start. We have school SAP, which is really important. Um, uh, students assistance person. So it's, uh, I think in the past they would have been called like a drug and alcohol counselor. And Tim Schub is an incredibly talented human being. Um, but again, the, the ethos is, is about focusing on the positive and saying, all right, you're not feeling it right now, and this is, comes from some of the Iceland model research, which I don't know, I'm sure you all have yeah. seen, mm -hmm. but you know, one of their, their tenets was change what the kids are doing, don't just talk about it, right? So what are, the, what are the structures that you can change around that young person to get them involved? And some of that involves taking some risks. Having, uh, having programs, for instance, we had a kid a couple years ago who we really went down the road of personalized learning with. He was pretty frustrated in school, so we were able to get him some, and I'd say rigorous credits, but through building tiny houses. This was what he wanted to do. He built, and, and he was able to get math and English credit via, via that. So there, there are just lots of different ways of your creative to build relationships and partnerships. But it starts with that advisor, in my opinion. Okay. I just was curious. Um, how are you sharing your information, your methods with other schools, with your peers? That's a good question. Uh, it's been fast and furious, so you know all of the survey stuff we've done over the past year has been it's been quick and dirty. There's lots going on, so I, that's our, our plan over the summer and the fall. But I have a principals network, a Chittenden County principals network. I've, I've shared that with them. I talk a lot, so that's the main thing. We rely on Jay. Uh, too, but we need to more widely distribute that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would like to make that app accessible to everybody. I can't imagine now they're like, like how have we not always been doing this? Mm -hmm. That's what my, wife, my wife's response is. You know, I'm like, oh, we got graduation standards. They're K-12 now. She's like, wait, you didn't always have that? I'm like, oh, I guess not. You know, I mean, yeah. 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 So we're we're gonna get on the road, and then just it's that's a question of resources because Brian has a a, a day job, <laughs> so trying to figure that that piece out. Um, parents, mm -hmm. guardians, um, can you talk a little bit about how they're involved? Sure. If you look at the developmental assets. Parents, guardians, neighborhoods. We all, I mean, it's common sense, right? It's factored hugely into a student's success. So they, be, they become partners with us in the survey, first of all, as they're filling it out. Um, but just like with students, you have to invite them into it. Right? So at the beginning of our network, we have our core program where our goal is to have 100% of our parents, as students are entering CVU, meet with their teachers. Uh, and, and administrators, and that's, you'd be surprised how hard it is to get to 100%, but you have to be tenacious, and you have to believe that it's really important, because it's easy to not believe that families are crucial uh, in, in this work. Sometimes you want to push families away. Um, so, I mean, I, again, it, I think it comes, it comes down to those mechanisms that you have in school that bring, bring community in, and then you can go out. You can go out to community as well, but you've got to be, it's hard, it's, it's hard to get to 100%. So what percent are you at? For our ninth grade? I mean, for our ninth grade intake meetings, like 99% for our PLP <coughs> meetings, I would say 80%-ish, uh, 80%-ish, ish but we're, you know, That's pretty that, I'm kind of making that number up on the spot, so I'm not <laughs> too much. <laughs> How typical is CVU in terms of 
or what, what, when you talk about structure, mm -hmm. and I think that that's the things outside of school. And so I'm wondering in terms of what your students come with in terms of um, economics yeah. and race, <coughs> and where that fits in in terms of feelings of connectedness and that. Yeah. I wouldn't want to speak for, I mean, I've, I've worked in, at CU, I taught at Tech Center in Essex for a little while, and I was principal of Montpelier High School for a few years, and, and Montpelier and CU were pretty similar in terms of those demographics. Um, from what I hear, and Jay can speak to this better than I could, not to put you on the spot, but our, we're, we have an incredibly supportive community. Um, that has some resources, now having said that, I think sometimes that group that's in a lower socioeconomic status is almost more divided as a, as a result because there's a sharper um, marginal, you know, a sense of being marginalized. Uh, so I think we're similar to other communities in that regard, but um, we do have some real advantages. Um, we have about half a minute, I think, before we need to go to the floor. Um, are there other questions? Did you have, I saw the hands over here. Tucker asked me a question. Okay, your question? Just, just quickly, do you collect your data with phones or mm -hmm. it's all electronic? Mm -hmm. So you could do this whenever something came up. Yeah. Just text everybody, they answer the survey. Yeah, now we have the <coughs> analytics to see when they're responding, which is really interesting. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we try to do it all at the same time, but then, you know, obviously some kids are out of school and it's like, oh, two in the morning, you're taking this. Okay. Right. <laughs> Gives me another piece of data. <laughs> Actually, the all really interesting to see the teachers that students note for who they're connected to, because you can start to see the areas that you're like, oh, interesting. This teacher is science, this one's math. Oh, this, this student really tends to gravitate towards STEM just in the relationships they're building. Interesting. Let's pay attention to that. How can we start guiding a student's path? Uh, uh, Carl, if you have a quick question, the okay. red light is yeah, I'll the bells are going. Sorry. Just, I mean, if, just in a couple of words, how would you define what's the defining difference between this survey and other surveys that people that students have taken? We're acting on it. I have lots of data that just sits on my shelf. The survey is not an honor. It's not anonymous. The yep. second you start doing things anonymous, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's a problem. Well, this is very specific to the individual. Yeah. The intent is an invitation yeah. and a discussion. So thank you. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you, absolutely. Yeah. So and I can see why you're principal of the year. Yeah. Okay. I'll show that I saw it. Thanks. Um, we have about an hour or so. Um, to uh, hear testimony around um, Proposition 5. Um, and we've got two people who are testifying. Um, and then we have some questions for Bryn or um, uh, follow up with her as well. And so, Carrie. Good morning, Mr. there's a note on here. I'm sorry, I may need. Um, so, um, committee, if you had looked at your um, email with the schedule last week, um, it had Guy Page on there. Um, Guy hadn't gotten the email that was sent, and he has a new role, um, and uh, he is usual. He is anyway. So he's, he's moving into being a um, member of the press or a blog, so, but he still has some commitments and he hasn't gotten the information. And in the meantime, I think over the weekend, or at least when I got it, or on Monday, Carrie had um, emailed Julie um, around uh, speaking um, for a lawyer who's unable to come. And so she has, so that is why it's not got page. <laughs> um, and, uh, I did just submit the Thank you. testimony. Believe it or not, looking at at least my desk, we're, we try to go paperless. Right, got it. Um, so my name's Carrie Handy, and um, I have been asked by Helen to read this testimony. Helen is actually a professor of law at George Mason University in um, D.C. or in Virginia. Um, I'm sorry, Carrie. We have lots of ambient noise. Speak up. Thank you. Does this work? 
I mean, it's, at, dude, it's recording you. That's yeah. recording. Oh, that's so recording. if someone wants that afterwards, and um, okay. All right. Thank um, you. So if you need more on me or more of my credentials, Helen and I have been um, colleagues for a number of years, mostly because I'm a journalist, and she and I are, um, have brought across each other a number of times over these issues that we're talking about today. So getting right to her testimony, um, thank you sincerely for this opportunity to present testimony concerning Proposal 5. It's a momentous event when a state amends its very constitution, especially considering the age of the Vermont Constitution and its generous recognition of natural, inherent, and unalienable rights, and of government's purpose for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people. So given this human rights language and the medically supported fact that abortion destroys the life of the human being, Proposal 5 is a humanitarian tragedy which can only stain the legal and social fabric of Vermont. Abortion advocates do not appear to take this moment very seriously. In her testimony, Carrie Brown, Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, uh, speaking before the House Committee on Health Care, devotes less than a full page toward justifying all abortions at any time and for any reason. She uses a total of eight footnotes, seven of which rely upon the online summary of a turnaway study written by abortion advocates, or an online news report by the same study written by one of its research directors. The eighth footnote supports a statement concerning the high rates of unintended, unintended pregnancy among poor women. Here are the significant shortcomings of such an argument. First, it's neither wise nor respectful of the important deliberative role of a state legislature to offer testimony supported almost exclusively with the conclusions of researches ideologically committed to abortion. Second, although the official summary and online reporting regarding the Turnaway study sometimes employ the language of causation, a reading of the studies themselves indicates that the authors are, at best, able to determine only a correlation between a woman's being denied an abortion and subsequent experiences in events such as poverty, receipt of public assistance, single parenting, full-time employment, and maternal bonding. Uh, in the study, the authors concede that there may be no there may be no proof that an abortion turnaway actually caused negative outcomes for, um, a for a woman's existing children. Instead, some third factor like a woman's chaotic life, propensity for risk, poor relationship with the father, health or income status, etc., led both to her unintended pregnancy and to her delayed search for an abortion such that she was turned away as being too far along, and to the situation of the existing children in her home post turn away. I hope that made sense. It was a long sentence. Furthermore, the authors of this study admit what so many others studying unintended pregnancy have admitted. The term is an inherently complex phenomenon to measure and often mistakenly includes women who have mixed or ambivalent feelings and later come to welcome the children that they bear. These same types of error plague all of abortion advocates' claims that unintended pregnancies or denied abortions cause poverty or single parenting or less employment or other losses. Researchers regularly fail to capture the meaning of unintended, and they are regularly forced to admit that third factors, such as poverty, low education, risk taking, poor health, violent relationships, among others, are responsible both for unintended pregnancy and for what these same women experience post birth. Third, if correlation matters, and even if one can draw a causal line between fewer abortions, and some of the events and experiences women undergo, then it would have to be acknowledged that as abortion numbers and rates declined from the early 1990s to today, women's participation in the labor force and in higher education has grown. At the same time, soon after abortion became legal and numbers of abortions rose precipitously in the US, women's levels of happiness declined. So that for the first time in recent history, women reported themselves less happy than men. It's helpful to look first at figures taken from reliable federal labor and education and healthcare databases, and you'll see that there's all this is footnoted um, in this document I've submitted. 
Here we find that abortion rates declined steadily in every year from 1991 to 2014, both in terms of absolute numbers and in ratios. In 1991, there were nearly 1.4 million abortions, 338 for 1,000 for every 1,000 live births, 24 per 1,000 women of reproductive age. By 2014, the federal government reported 650,000 abortions. During that same time, however, rates of women's labor force participation grew from about 66.6% .6 in 1991 to 70.2% in 1996, peaking at 71.2% in the year of the Great Recession and settling at about 70.8% currently. Over the past six decades, including the past three, during which abortion rates and numbers have been declining, the percentage growth of the labor force for women has been greater than for men. Women's completion rates for higher education have also soared during the last several decades, declines in abortion numbers and rates. In 1991, for example, women achieved parity with men regarding the completion of four years of college. Today, when abortion rates are about half of their 1991 figures, 6% more American women are annually completing a four-year college education and women in the United States are generally more likely than men to have a bachelor's degree. Women self-reported happiness, however, took a sharp dive after the 1970s when abortion became legal and widespread. A widely hailed study by two economists at the University of Pennsylvania reported that previously women traditionally reported higher levels of happiness than men. In the 1990s, by the 1990s, however, women were less happy than men. The decline is, in their words, ubiquitous and holds for both working and stay-at-home mothers, for those married and divorced, for the old and the young, and across the education distribution. <coughs> it's also similar as between the United States and almost all of the nations of Western Europe where abortion has, for the most part, been freely available during those decades. <coughs> the authors cannot pinpoint the precise reasons for these declines, but ask, did men garner a disproportionate share of the benefits of the women's movement? Alternatively, perhaps the well-being data point to different, excuse me, differential impacts of social changes on men and women, with women being particularly hurt by declines in family life, rises in inequality, or reductions in social cohesion. They also ask about the decline's possible relationship to a changed sexual marketplace made possible by the sexual revolution, of which non-marital sex, contraception, and abortion were a part, and its effects upon women. Fourth, claims that easily available abortion is a one-way ratchet favoring women's well-being fail to account for its possible negative effects. An honest evaluation of the sum total of outcomes associated with abortion would at least have to know that more than a few studies in top medical journals have raised the possibilities of harmful psychological and physical health effects upon women. Abortion advocates regularly and vehemently dismiss as partisan all claims that women experience post-abortion difficulties. But a close look at these studies reveal them to be not at all partisan. Um, I, and I'm speaking for Helen, recall during time during the early 2000s as an appointee of the Council of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the um, NIH. Several times in that role, I implored the leadership to study the mental and physical effects upon women, if any, of undergoing an abortion, and no action was taken. If abortion advocates wished to know the answer to the question of abortion's effects upon women, they would pursue it honestly with the ample academic tools and budgets at their disposal. Furthermore, there is a flourishing body of literature regarding the effects of legal abortion upon the sexual market, sexual marketplace, leading to more, not fewer, non-marital pregnancies and births. In literature by leading economists, including President Obama's appointee as the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank, Janet Yellen, scholars claim that as compared with other explanations of non-marital pregnancies and births, a technology shock hypothesis <coughs> Going to be a long sentence. Combined with the declining stigma of a non marital birth, better explains the magnitude and timing of changes in the numbers and rates of non marital pregnancies and births during a historical period in which federal, state, and private support for both contraception and abortion were increasingly widespread. 
they conclude that the current sex and mating market enabled both by contraception and abortion operates to the disadvantage of women respecting pregnancy and marriage and the relative advantage of men due to a series of incentives structured by their availability. First, and this is a quote, when the cost of abortion is low or contraceptives are readily available, potential male partners can easily obtain sexual satisfaction without making promises to marry in the event of pregnancy and will thus be reluctant to commit to marriage, end of quote. Single women thus feel pressured because if they do not participate in sex, they are at a classic competitive disadvantage because sexual activity without commitment is increasingly expected in premarital relationships. If they ask for a guarantee of marriage in the event of pregnancy, they are afraid their partners will seek other relationships. The stigma of non-marital non parenting then declines as more and more women bear children without marriage. According to this theory, even women who want children reject contraception and abortion and want a marriage guarantee as a condition for sex, have non-marital sex anyway because it's the price of entering the mating market. Such a market, in these researchers' view, is therefore likely to produce higher rates of sexual activity, non-marital pregnancy, non-marital births, and abortions all at the same time. This is all from a study that Helen is referencing. You can see footnote in this document. Eminent Princeton. Oh, thank you. Almost done. An eminent Princeton sociologist, Sarah McClanahan, relying upon the above research, notes further that while the pill likely boosted women's confidence to invest in advanced education, it is also true that both the pill and legalized abortion made it easier for men to shirk their parental responsibilities. In sum, the simplistic notion that abortion is clearly and causally linked to improved well-being for women is easily falsified. Clearly, many important factors help cause the rises in women's educational and labor force participation rates during the very periods of time in which abortion rates were falling. And clearly, abortion has not assisted the families of the poor. In the United States, non-marital births as a percentage of all births have risen during the time of abortion's legal availability. They rose from 5% in 1960 to about 18% in 1980 to 33% in the mid-1990s to over 40% in 2013 where the rate covers today. The poor who annually receive billions of federal and state dollars to pay for contraception and abortion have the very highest rates of non-marital births. And the single family form that results tends to reproduce itself intergenerationally, helping to cause a historically large gap between richer and poorer, between black and white Americans, determined very largely by family structure. As for the equality and freedom of women in relation to abortion, it must be said that it's a sad day for women when abortion is valorized as the means to such ends. If abortion advocates are right, and the child is nothing more than a part of the mother's body and her property, then the case for legal abortion boils down to an argument that women are required to destroy a part of themselves in order to achieve equality. If opponents of abortion are right, and abortion destroys a completely vulnerable, genetically unique, self-developing human life, then the case for legal abortion boils down to the claim that a woman has to destroy another's life in order to be equal. There is no logical, complete, or intellectually sound argument that widely available legal abortion favors women's well-being, happiness, and freedom. There are too many counterexamples, too many questions abortion advocates are afraid to explore, and too much human and moral history demonstrating that a program of even legally sanctioned violence against vulnerable human beings can never have a happy ending. It should also be noted, in closing, the Proposal 5's particular support for personal reproductive autonomy is a recipe, recipe for humanitarian disaster. This notion of self-law, autonomous, has been employed by scholars and activists in the family and reproduction fields to justify everything from genetically engineered babies to cloning to the purchase of gametes or embryos on the basis of a prediction that a child technologically engineered from superior materials quote-unquote, will have certain traits including skin color, talent, intelligence, and beauty. It is unimaginable that Vermont wants to adopt not only unlimited abortion, but also give parents and doctors unlimited power and direction over the human beings of the next generation. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Um, when you emailed us, and it might be on there, um, but if you could just for the record, 
comment on who's you, um, who I just read. Who you just read, yeah. so that we um, know the source and um, right. and that's that's clear. Sorry, I, I don't know how to use this. Um, I have her right here. Um, Helen is a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, George Mason University, where she teaches family law, law and religion, property law. She publishes on matters concerning marriage, parenting, non-marital households, and the First Amendment religion clauses. She is a faculty advisor to the school's Civil Rights Law Journal and the Latino Law Student Association, a consultant for the Pontifical Council of the Laity in Vatican City, an advisor to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C., founder of WomenSpeakForThemselves.com, and an ABC News consultant. She cooperates with the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See of the United Nations as a speaker and a delegate to various United Nations conferences um, concerning women and the family. In addition to her books and her publications in law reviews and other academic journals, Professor Alvarez publishes regularly in news outlets including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and USA Today. She also speaks at academic and professional conferences in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and Australia. And prior to joining the faculty of Scalia Law, Professor Alvarez taught at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America, represented the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops before legislative bodies, academic audiences, and media, and was a litigation attorney for the Philadelphia law firm of Stradley, Ronan, Stevens, and Young. She received her law degree from Cornell University School of Law and her master's in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, I mean, thank you. I, mean, I, I appreciate that. I think it was important for people to um, really hear the extent of her background and her publication and her knowledge so that um, yes. it would have been great to have her here in person and I am honored that I was able to read this testimony on her behalf. Thank you. Are there any questions that you want me to convey to Helen? Are there questions to convey to Helen? Carl, I can't tell. <coughs> you look like you're about I'm to say something. I'm to formulate something. Okay. <laughs> okay. Were there any other means of, uh, let's say, birth control uh, other than abortion that that she was that she talks about birth control, but abortion seems to be the mainly issue that she's talking about here. And any other ways to achieve uh, say, success in this area? Um, Helen is actually uh, an outspoken proponent of women um, having reproductive freedom through um, better relationships with men and choices in that regard. Um, I think that, if I understand your question correctly, she didn't speak about this in all the aspects of this proposal five, which really extends to um, you know, reproductive freedom. I understand, and she understands abortion is actually explicitly mentioned. Um, I think that uh, she could speak at length, and I can ask her to, to give something more specific, but reproductive, Opening up reproductive freedom to um, a constitutional amendment is, is very open-ended, and she can, she makes that very clear um, that it would not be <coughs> in the best interest of anyone, really. I mean, when you think about it, we can't even agree on um, how to interpret the right to life in the Constitution, but to, to open it up in this way seems to be very dangerous. So, okay, thank you. Can I just have a question? Where does she live? She's in um, Virginia. She's from Virginia? Yeah. And you said you were a journalist? Uh, right. I, I actually live in St. Albans. I, I'm a freelance writer. I've also worked for the Roman Catholic Diocese in the past. That's actually where I first came across Helen. Uh, we work together with Women Speak for Themselves. Um, I've written for everything from Vegetarian Times to the St. Albans Messenger to Crisis Magazine. So, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Carrie, Thank for you. being a stand-in. Thank you. I know it was long. <laughs> <laughs> it was helpful, and, and um, having it online so that we can read it and go back to it, especially one person is still not here. She's, she's in the principal's office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Four. I did not submit a written testimony yet, but I, I will. Uh, th that will follow up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Bor Yang with the Vermont Human Rights Commission. I am the executive director and legal counsel. Um, I'm sure you know, but for the record, the Human Rights Commission is a state agency that um, has a relatively large mandate. We are required to investigate claims of discrimination <coughs> in housing places of public accommodations, and in-state government employment. We also have a statutory requirement to educate outreach and also um, advance public policies that impact um, people who are protected under our statutes. Um, some of the categories that are protected are sex, breastfeeding, um, and uh, pregnancy. Um, certainly if someone were discriminated against based on the fact that they've had an abortion, that would be the type of case that we could take um, at the Human Rights Commission, although we have not, um, fortunately, have had to um, handle such a, a matter. So the Human Rights Commission strongly supports um, PR5. Uh, we firmly believe that the right to have an abortion and the right to not have an abortion is a fundamental human right. It is a right that transcends race and national origin and socioeconomic um, status. But I do think, because I'm from the Human Rights Commission, that it would be important to sort of talk about the interrelationship between race, uh, socioeconomic status, and the right to reproductive liberty. Um, a person's access to timely, affordable abortion care can be profoundly impacted by her race, her socioeconomic status, and what resources are available to her. We know that women of color and women of low socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to be impacted by funding cuts to programs and services that provide health care in their communities. They have fewer reproductive health care providers in their neighborhoods. Black and Hispanic women and women of all races and low socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to have insurance coverage for contraception and family planning care. This is why we see women of color and women of low socioeconomic status grappling with unintended pregnancies and choosing abortion at greater rates than their affluent white um, women. These disparities also match disparities in education, income, infant mortality rates, cancer, and life expectancy. In fact, unintended childbirth as well as adverse maternal and infant health effects are associated with decreased opportunities for education and paid employment. When women have the right to control their bodies, they have equal opportunities to meaningfully participate in society. Women of color and women in poverty already face high levels of stress in the workplace. They are the group of people that are most likely to face discrimination. They are the group of people that are most likely to face sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and they are the group of people that are most likely coming from poor living and work and end up working in um, poor working conditions. So the right to decide if and when they start a family should not also be a barrier to equal opportunity. That's it. Any questions? Um, so um, from what I uh, gathered from your testimony, um, women of color um, have uh, less access to um, contraception um, my brain just went like that. Like uh, birth control, uh, and and so they have a higher rate of unintended pregnancies. Is that essentially what you're yes. saying? Yes, they have not just access to birth control, but they have less access to healthcare, and they have less access to healthcare providers in their communities and um, family planning programs and services. 
Um, often when we see government cuts, it's cutting to programs that serve these particular women. Mm -hmm. And it, so is what you're saying um, specific to Vermont or uh, in general in terms of in our general, healthcare policy? Sure, in general, but certainly there are women of color and w many women of low socioeconomic statuses in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Um, Carl, did you have your hand up? No. Okay, then it's Topper. Um, we just heard some testimony about people from low-income families and so on, and it talked about billions of dollars, federal and state dollars, being put towards people in that particular instance so that they could have access. Um, you made the statement that they don't. So I would like to know what the source of your information is. Um, I, I, I definitely have cited these things, and um, I can provide that in the written testimony too. But in which specific fact would you like me to cite? The, um, they have fewer reproductive health care providers in their neighborhoods. Uh, that all of it. Huh? All of it. Okay. Um, and would you like me to state so right now on the record or in my written testimony? However you want to do it. Okay, sure. Because I want to look at it. Yes. I, I've got references in this testimony yes. that I can go and look at. Yeah. So I want I, to I absolutely it. will provide that to you. Um, but I can say it's the Gutmacher Institute, um, Elisa von Hegel and Daniela Mansbach called Reproductive Rights in the Age of Human Rights. Um, that's a 2016 study. And those are the two that I wrote here in just my talking points. But okay. in my written testimony, that will be provided to you. OK, good. Yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions for Boer? Boer, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You so thank much. Um, <clears throat> do we have anything, Bryn, do we have anything that we would like Bryn to get back to um, or to provide us with information based on what we have heard um, today? Um, or? Not to mention but from before um, okay. the sterilization issue. Okay, the sterilization issue. Were you here in the room? I was not here okay. the last time you heard this. Um, okay, can you repeat the issue? Sure. The concern? Yeah. Um, uh, my question is about whether anything in Prop 5, um, how it intersects with our current laws around sterilization and who can make decisions. Uh, I'm familiar with who can make decisions around sterilization. So when it's when Prop 5 is referring to the individual, is it referring to the person who uh, can make that decision, or is it referring to the, in this case, the potential individual with a disability? Okay. So, are we talk, are we talking specifically in the context of a person who has um, either an advanced directive or uh, somebody who's acting as their um, agent? Agent. <laughs> um, or guardian. Or guardian. It, my, the situations that I'm particularly referring to are. Um, young women of childbearing age whose, um, in most cases, their parents are their guardian and seek to have sterilization performed. Um, and so what I am, what I need information about is the rights that are being protected in Prop 5, are they the rights of the individual with a disability or are they the rights of the um, person seeking to have that person sterilized? Okay. Um, and Bryn, if I um, heard the, the um, testimony from the, <clears throat> the testimony from um, Helen um, Alvarez, uh, I wasn't following it written, but I thought there was comments around <coughs> the notion of self-law, she said. And so I'm curious as to what that is and um, um, I will, I will take a look at that written testimony. Okay. Um, I, I share that. Okay. Um, Thomas. Friend, did we ever get uh, a definition of 
uh, personal reproductive autonomy. A definition of what those words mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we well, talked a little bit about how a, how a, shall I join you? Uh-huh, yes, please. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Makes more sense. <laughs> So for the record, Grant here from Legislative Council. We talked a little bit about how a court will interpret those words. Um, typically, as we've talked about before, a court will look at the plain meaning of a particular word or phrase in interpreting the meaning of that word or phrase. Um, and if it is unclear from the plain meaning or the definition of that word, then the court has uh, will look to other sources to infer what the meaning is. So for example, a purpose section or the legislative record um, but I think that the conversation about personal reproductive liberty was that it's likely that a plain dictionary um, definition of those words will be sufficient for a court to understand the meaning. And I can um, tell you what the, what the dictionary definition is of those words, if that's helpful. Would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay, so the Merriam-Webster defines personal as of, affecting, or belonging to a particular person rather, to, rather than to anyone else. <clears throat> reproductive means relating to or affecting reproductions. And reproduction refers to the system of sex organs that function together for the purpose of sexual reproduction. And autonomy. Autonomy. What is autonomy? What's the plain meaning of autonomy? So the plain... So um, I didn't look up the dic dic dictionary definition. I think that would be right. So um, the freedom to self-determine or make decisions for oneself. But I will get you the dictionary definition if that's helpful. And just for the record, would this mean that an individual could make the decision? Of reproduction all the way through um, to birth and including birth. Make a decision about reproduction. Um, because the next sentence, if I remember right, says something about uh, life's having control over life's course or something like that. Liberty and dignity will determine yeah, yeah, one's own yeah. life course. Mm -hmm. So is that is that it? So, so is that a correct assumption? Well, I think, you know, I, as I've said before, the court will interpret um, the extent to which um, the right to personal reproductive autonomy, the extent to what that protects. Um, and again, I will say again that um, that connecting it to the strict scrutiny standard means that it does not prohibit a state from regulating uh, the right to abortion or um, contraception as long as any regulation meets that um, standard of strict scrutiny. Carl. Yeah, Thank you. I'm still having a little trouble here understanding when it says that an individual's right, an individual could be a man or a woman, is that correct? In mm -hmm. this context, okay. So if i looking at it from a man's perspective, he has an individual right to personal reproductive autonomy and let's say he, he he wants to procreate life he has procreated life and the partner with which he's procreated life with is not interested in this it seems that we have a conflict between one person's reproductive right and the other and I, I read this several times I still don't quite see the how should I say it, that it, it would give the woman the right to have an abortion. So can you tell, are you suggesting that it may indicate that a man's right to have a child would override the right of a woman to have an abortion? I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm asking how that would be so. It seems like it would end up being a, a, a battle in court, all of them, because mm -hmm. both people would have, you know, if, their their life destiny or how is it their their thought of their own life's course. The man's looking, this is his or their progeny, okay? And the female's decided that she doesn't want to pursue that life course. 
So there's two life courses that are not uh, synonymous in this case. But and how does it get settled? And, uh, you know, we're saying that there, as I said, obviously one is carrying the child. I understand that, but it would seem to me that if we're giving an individual, and the individual is either a male or a female, how, how can it be decided, and on what basis is it decided? So I, I think that you're right that it would be up to a court to determine um, how to apply Article 22 in that situation. And I think what I said the last time I was here is that, um, in my opinion, I think that it's unlikely that a court will apply Article 22 in a way that directly infringes on the right of a woman to have an abortion, because that would be a sort of direct undermining of the right to reproductive liberty as it's understood in um, U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence that talks about the right to abortion. So it's going to go back to the Supreme Court decision, I mean, uh, Roe versus Wade, versus this this article or this uh, pro proposition? Then? Well, in, in the court, I don't think the proposition is clear <laughs> about that issue at all. That, you know, uh, look like a man's rights are being abridged. Use another term in here, okay, or what we call it, uh, infringed, okay, by the action of his partner. So I hear I hear you saying that you don't think that it's clear. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I what I'm saying is that um, based on the history of um, the U.S. Supreme Court and deciding cases about abortion. I think that the Vermont Supreme Court will likely look to that body of jurisprudence in determining what um, the right to reproductive liberty means and what it protects. Um, and typically, the regulations on uh, reproductive choice have centered around women and women's bodies. And so the court will likely look to that history in interpreting what Article 22 means. Well, doing a flip around, if I could just continue on mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. As long as, I mean, with questions, we're not trying to persuade, right? We're yeah. not trying to persuade. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a question, but I'm, well, yes, so they said if the shoe is on the other foot here, I'm mm -hmm. flipping the coin, if you will, and saying, so now a man wants a vasectomy because he doesn't want children, but his wife does, okay? And so can she prevent him from having, uh, I should say, it would seem that she would not be able to prevent him from having a second. No, I mean, it centers on personal reproductive autonomy. So I think that that word personal really indicates that it's up to the individual to make a decision for themselves about their own reproductive choices. Um, so I, I look at that word personal as being a significant word in the article. And an indication it that it doesn't, wouldn't allow for anybody to make a choice for somebody else. two people to create the life. So, you know, both people are involved in this process. Yes. Sandy. Anyway, I guess so. Sandy has questions um, or legal responses or more information. So I, I'm looking at the, the language of Article 22. Um, most of the time when we're talking about constitutional rights, whether state or federal, we are talking about state action. And so when I read this, shall not be infringed or denied, I'm, I'm, I have in my head parents that say, brackets that say, by, by state. state action. That's a question. Yes. Question mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree that the, um, the language of the article signals to the court that this is a, um, an indication about what the legislate the parameters on the legislature, if the legislature chooses to regulate um, the right to abortion or, or any other right that might be protected under under the article. And, and if that's correct, then I guess in the the he versus she hypothetical, it becomes not applicable. Yes, I, I think that it's a little bit more of a challenge for me to see a situation where a person could um, could assert a right under 
under Article 22 as an individual, um, as opposed to having a regulation imposed on them that they um, are challenging as unconstitutional. What does it mean to be a self-executing clause? Um, so the second sort of purpose of the, of the second phrase of the article that directs the court to use a strict scrutiny standard is um, a signal to the court that the article is a self-executing article, meaning that um, a suit can be brought under the article. So for example, the Common Benefits Clause is also a self-executing article of the Constitution as opposed to Article One, which um, sort of is a broader uh, is a broader article that indicates the policy of the, of the state and it's not um, a self-executing article. And self-executing means what? That, a, that, a, an, individual. that a, an individual can um, challenge a regulation under that article. Um, are there other, um, at this juncture, information that we would like to bring to come to, come back to? I, I, didn't, I mean, probably not today, but if there's other research that, yeah. I know we talked about having a judge come here. Uh, right, and, and, and what we talked about was that um, having a sitting judge who would, who would, by their actual position, have to um, rule. rule is not appropriate. And so what we um, will do is we will have various people, and Bryn can talk about that as well, in terms of the criteria by which people, judges, make decisions. And they should. Like that. No. Look for a retired judge? Yeah, so something like that. I think there are potential um, challenges with that in terms of, and I will speak to something that's been in the press recently that a retired judge sat and made a decision on. So to have, um, to have a retired, I mean, I think it is, you know, I think what we need to do is have people who are lawyers and we, you know, um, and perhaps um, we could, the, the constitutional person who is the professor um, um, that we just heard from who teaches at Georgetown, they could perhaps, George Mason, they could perhaps add that to their comments and if other people, but I think it is, it's not um, appropriate to go back further and other, and so that's one place that we can get. We can get it from there in terms of what what kinds of decisions. What are the, I mean, because the criteria, if the criteria was black and white in one way, we wouldn't need judges to make decisions. They have to weigh the specific facts of the case. And so I think what um, perhaps this committee needs is a little primer on um, that because otherwise the specific facts of a case, the unique facts of a case, and the presentation of the information based on certain criteria, which are unique to the facts of that case, are how decisions get made. Now I'm not a lawyer, so you want to have people who are um, who are lawyers, which is what judges are. Judges are lawyers. Um, is to talk about those. So, Bryn, if you can help us with that, not today, um, so that would be helpful as well. Madam and, Chair, yeah. lawyers don't have to be judges. I mean, judges don't have to be lawyers. I believe they do. Um, Most I of beg them are, to differ. But, but you know, Most of them are, but you don't have to. Correct. No, I, As Supreme Court justices need to be pro lawyers. <clears throat> We had one here in Vermont that was not a lawyer. I'm wondering about a magistrate. I think it's possible. I have, I'd have to check on the statute for you. My understanding is that the um, that there have to be some minimum qualifications. One of which is that they are an attorney. It may there may be a different rule for a magistrate. I think what his name was. Check. 
Well, you will, rather than us relying on, um, I mean, past history or our memory or our, what is a Supreme Court justice, which is the, really what we're talking about, because that's who makes these decisions. If you could get back to us on that as well. to do that. Because the last thing I wanted to talk about is argue over um, what are the qualifications of a Supreme Court justice to get information. Either. I don't need that. Yeah. But you made the statement, and I. I mean, you just agree with it. I so we're going to go to our. So, so we're we'll going find to out if there was ever yeah. one. I, I almost remember trying to think of his name. But <clears throat> that's beside the point. I'm, I'm not asking for the judge to come in here. Uh, to, I'm asking for how they would interpret the language. That's what I'm interested in. And I think we need to start with how decisions get made, because how you will interpret it, um, and Topper, maybe um, I am misinterpreting what you and um, some others have are asking for. You're asking for how they will interpret a certain, that will depend upon the facts. I, I think if I recall, there was an interest in, the, in understanding from a judge or an attorney, I think from a judge, what a compelling state interest. That's which, that, yeah. that, was, that was the line I remember as the, and what we constitute. And, we will, and, and as I said, we will, we will get from a lawyer what is a compelling state interest. If there was a very clear answer to what is a compelling state interest that was mm -hmm. um, uniform, then why would we go to court? It would be clear as a bell. Why would it differ as to whether what the facts of the case are? So I, we get into, I think, looking for insurance mm -hmm. That may not necessarily be. It. This is a, that's what courts and mm -hmm. stuff are all about. Um, Madam Chair. Yeah. Maybe a compelling state interest could negate the phrase personal reproductive, reproductive autonomy. autonomy. Yeah. That's well, what I'm trying to get at. Is is there something in the way this is written? That doesn't jive, and, and that's what I'm worried about. That's why I was saying, how would a judge interpret this? Well, if I understand that question, which I may or may not, um, the language signals to the court that any regulation that restricts that right, the right that the article enumerates, must, in order to be constitutional, it must be um, be due to a compelling state interest and be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. That is what the strict scrutiny test is. So it signals to the court what level of analysis to use in looking at the statute to determine if it's constitutional. So a state interest could override that fundamental right that's enumerated in the article if it meets the strict scrutiny test. You're making my case, Brent. So if a judge decided that having an abortion in the whatever trimester or whatever, if he felt that, then that could negate what would, what's being tried to Right, what, if, what if, the, to do if the legislature were to pass a law that would prohibit abortion at a certain stage of pregnancy and the court found that the state had a compelling interest in doing so and crafted that regulation in a way that was narrowly tailored to achieve that interest, then it would be a constitutional regulation. Like limited it to a certain time, <coughs> uh, period during gestation, like third trimester. That would be narrowly. I, again, that would be up to the court, and, and it would be up to what the regulation is, and it would be up to what the interest of the state was. Um, but it, again, it would have to it would have to be crafted in a way that act, that had the effect of 
um, achieving the interest that the state had in, in the regulation. So, Gren, what, um, which one of these things, in your opinion, um, the constitutional amendment or the bill that we produced best protects this right? Um, I think that the Proposition 5 and H57 work together to protect the right to abortion. Um, putting the right in the Constitution in the way that it's been drafted in Prop 5 would provide for a fundamental right that was protected in the state's like highest legal document. So, and H57 is a, obviously a law, and so the legislature is free to revisit that policy and change it in the future. Um, obviously, it's more difficult to change the Constitution in the future. Um, so, in some ways, the you know you could look at it you could look at it both ways. That Proposition Five offers maybe a more long-term protection of the right. Pro provided, provided it passes. Right. Right. I'm sorry. I assume that that's what you meant. If, if, yeah. if what they both no, no, I'm, I'm saying I'm sitting here today, and we we're, we we're, we already passed a bill out of here, and. Now we've got a constitutional amendment. And that thing takes two years to happen. In the meantime, um, Three, really. the other could be done. And we could do both. <laughs> As he rolls his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel this thing is ambiguous. I, I really it. don't. I, I understand. And, um, I, I just. Okay, Bryn, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, committee, we've got um, a 15-minute break for, and um, we we got three topics this afternoon. Um, we're going um, when we come back at 2:15. We're going to talk about lead, and then at 3:30. We're going to talk about um, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program sliding fee scale. We're going to get introduced to what is in the minimum wage bill as it passed the Senate. Um, so, I mean, some, I mean, some of this was because we actually had some time. So I'm not, oh, God. Because I don't, um, we have Reva, but I think Reva, no. Reva. Oh, Reva. Reva, you are coming. She's I'm here. She's here. <laughs> Um, I think we had questions for you. I hope so. Do you have answers? I hope so. We do. Do you want me to come in? Yes, please. Yes. We missed you. We have like, a committee. I know. I know. I know. It's like we thought you were a member of the committee. We celebrated. Then we come all the time. <laughs> Good afternoon. Reva Murphy, Deputy Commissioner uh, for Child Development in the Department for Children and Families. So we are engaging in our own examination. We're trying to keep it focused on, the, on child care, mm -hmm. which I realize sometimes the difference between child care and pre-K really only is the difference between where the money comes from. Um, but we won't go there. Okay. Uh, we had lot. We had various questions. One, some of which have to do with in the. One, I don't know if you have any prepared remarks. I don't have okay. prepared remarks. I'm just um, here to answer the, your questions. I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions that I think was why we asked you to come here. Sure. And then other people whose memory is better than mine or who, whatever. Um, as we are looking at um, child care facilities in the, um, in the version of S4 that has S40, thank you, whatever, S40, um, that passed um, House Education, it identifies three different kinds or four different kinds of fixtures in, 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 um, in education. Is this the right one? I was the that's first time I've seen that's the, the amendment. Idea. That's the amendment that passed. Um, no, that's our, that's this the amendment. Is the right that Oh, okay. This is no one else. No one's. We sort of asked um, Mike O'Grady 
to um, um, put some stuff up there. This is the first time any, and Michael Grady's not here, so we're all like, oh my God, how do we do this? But one of the things, Logan, if you or someone could scroll down, mm -hmm. um, one of the things was to add, it seemed in, in, in reporting there was something, oh my, oh. This is not um, it's, it's up. You have to, I want the fixtures. Okay, that's, oh. that's in the bill as passed by the Senate. Or passed by the Senate. Okay. It's on page. Oh, okay. It's on page 12 of 13 of the education version. And and we were seeking to insert Commissioner for Children and Families into those places. Oh, so, 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 so I mean, what, what is challenging about this? So is, this is, the, um, no wonder you look confused because it's, it's not okay. a strike all. Um, so just I have this, I have, I have, I have the other one. Okay, that's, good. That's, that's the one that's I have. Page, okay, good. Page 12 so, has the fixtures. Can, so, uh, yeah. although that, the fixtures doesn't seem to be in this amendment that um, Mike has done for us. One of, um, part of the conversation that this committee has had is that in the version that passed House Page had, 12. Page 12. Mm -hmm. 11 pages on this. Well, I think this, they mean on this one. I've got things. As past, as, we need as past. Oh, as as we need house We need house You have That's to go so between. Like, right there, under Friday. Well, 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 you're touching it. Well. Yeah. There you go. Phew. I would end up in somebody's private email. <laughs> this is this is why he's at the end. Yeah, five pointed. Yeah. Okay. Five pointed, that's the one I do. Okay, good. Um, there was only one type of fixture it yes. was identified for yes. child care facilities. And in our conversations, we were like, that doesn't seem right. Um, because especially in terms of child care facilities, they may have other kinds. And so one of the things we're talking about is having those same um, possibilities for child care facilities. Um, so. Um, I did, I did, Crystal and I touched base, um, and uh, she said that we are aware there are some public, there are drinking fountains in some child care programs, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and there are outlets used for cooking. Right. So, um, just, I mean, I, I don't know, so given that, would, um, would would you have any um, issue with us saying, you know, you should at least consider that for these? Yes, that's that we'd have no problem with that. Okay. You were talking about the adding. I was just going to make her aware of the, yeah. um in, in a couple of sessions, it asked the Commissioner of Health to confer with the Agency of Natural Resources yes. and somebody else. and. Even though you're all in the same agency, I felt like they should also confer with the Department for Children and Families. So we inserted that in a couple of places. Thank you. They are, anyways. I mean, we are working closely with that even now. Yes. But so, just, but just it's always nice to have. Mm -hmm. Just in case. And I will tell you, we have a pretty long-standing relationship with health on lots of things, from immunization to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We work together a lot. Just for conversation, there's some other amendments that people are thinking about. Um, to, to still, let, still trying to figure out, uh, but we had talked about um, doing some level of 100% um, funding on invoice so that it's, nobody's getting shortchanged and nobody's getting a windfall. Uh, oh, also, I hear you saying. It's also more accurate just in general. Uh, and some discussion about doing remediation, uh, not remediation, testing, and then um, holding off on remediation, but that really didn't go too far. But to allocate up to a certain amount maybe to um, um, remediation this year for maybe just the higher levels, uh, and then finish the rest next year. But the real crux of the whole thing was to switch from a fake arbitrary 70% number um, based on one picture, especially in our own world, when it doesn't reflect reality to a form 100% uh, based on the I realize it's more work, but it's also more accurate. Um, 
could figure that out. I, I um, just wanted to get your input on, um, you know, knowing the whole range of child care centers in terms of their largeness and smallness mm -hmm. and complexity. Um, you know, if you had any opinion or sense of the 70-30, like with the 30 being a hardship for any of these facilities, or is, does it feel like something they could handle? The smaller a program is, the smaller and the more hardship the expense is, because they don't have any margins mm -hmm. to speak of. So, um, but of course, if they're smaller, they have probably less faucets, so it's less remediation, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, that's all I, I would say. That you know, it is sometimes a struggle because there isn't a lot around the margins for them to pay for extra things. So, I mean, we'll follow whatever the law says. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in truth, for something like this, like I'm really happy the testing itself is going to be funded because that will make mm -hmm. the whole process a lot easier. Um, but it, you know, it, if you haven't got anything extra and you, you have to put it into this, and we do want them to comply because all of us want the kids to be safe. We don't want to be using bottled water. Um, it could be for some programs, particularly small ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, a friend, a friend. <laughs> it, it, it's, Calling a friend. Uh, I, yeah, I know about that. But we use that. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> I got that in my pocket. <laughs> um, I believe there's a term for what you're doing. It's it's it begins with an S. An S? Spy? There's yeah. so many S words. <laughs> Supporting? <laughs> Maybe it begins with an M, and it's two words. S and M? <laughs> oh my God. So what David was reminding me of, which I, I know of, I was just waiting for a question, is we do have uh, supplemental child care grants that are, that are when people are in danger of closing because of a large expense. Um, for something as small as 30% of a faucet fixture, it's a lot for them to go through to apply for one of those. But if they had a larger mediation project to do that would in, that would um, jeopardize their program, we could to. use those supplemental grants to yeah. assist them. We sort of had that in the back of our heads around um, if we have any big surprises, we hadn't anticipated. I mean, we've helped people replace boilers in the middle of winter. And so. Why use state funds for remediation in any case? I can get it for testing. I love answering this because then all the educators and everyone freak out. Um, but um, I mean, I mean, I mean, actually, it is on some level a, a serious question. Why? Why are? Why are we? Um, no matter who you are, no matter how big or small, no matter whether it is a. Um, all I know is, you know, my outlet wasn't $319 when I redid mine. Um, or $454. Or four hundred. <laughs> certainly not that. Uh, um, when, when there is available already a structure, which is the grants you were well, just talking. Well, the supplemental grants, one of the conditions is that you have to be in danger of closing your program. Oh. Which you have to okay. adjust. All right. So okay. that's why we were thinking if there Good were question. big remediations to do that that literally would endanger a program from remaining, we would do that. Replacing a faucet may not put them in that position. Mm -hmm. right. But if they had lead pipes, like but if they say, had lead pipes or yeah. some major problem, which I will say frankly will surprise me. We'll have mm -hmm. to see because we have been testing for years. Mm -hmm. So only if testing. We've only been tested, but don't forget, many of these programs are small, and even if we're testing one faucet, if it was in the pipes, it would probably yeah. have turned up. But, but, but if, we, if we have that, that's why I feel a little bit less anxious about major remediation. Okay. I feel, uh, but again, small bills can sometimes um, okay. be difficult for people, and that, this would be, those grants are a lot of work for someone to go through to get $200. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sandy. Uh, we had a witness the other day who said that your standard is the EPA standard of 15 parts per billion. I had, I had heard, I thought I remembered that you were at five. 
No, we're at 15 parts per billion now. Right. We support five parts per billion so what, in the bill. And, and you're testing results from the centers. From family homes. From family homes shows that the vast majority in the are test still within the are five still, are parts still under per five. So at least for the ones we've tested. Well, so you. one of our proposed amendments is that down the line you would make your regulations of um, Of course we will. Yes. True up. Okay. Yes. Actually maybe emergency rules, since this is so important, we have to do it immediately. Well we are uh, to be honest, we just um, we've been working all winter with um, school based programs around uh, beefing up exceptions uh, where there was any duplication. We've been working with them. And so we are planning to open the rules. If this all passes soon enough, we will try to do it all in one shot. And it would mean opening up family child care too, which we hadn't planned to do, but we could we probably do it together if to get this in while we do that process. But well, one way or the other we'll get it done. Right. I mean there there is some risk of opening up every right. single you know. versus this very this, this very singular, very important children's yeah. health thing that maybe it makes sense to do that. We can use an executive now yeah. to do one thing for a period of time. Eventually, we have to amend our rules. Um, so I have a couple questions. Run around testing that had, um, um, so I think I'm probably the only one that's confused about this, but um, in previous, in your current regulations that require testing, um, what's the difference between those individuals who are connected to a public water supply and those who are not, who have like private wells? Is there any difference in your testing because it's only be able to be reported for those who are private, is that right? Who are under that, I forget exactly what, but <laughs> under some special programming I'm gonna for testing. I'm going to open something. If Crystal was here, she could probably open it and do this off the top of her head. But um, I believe they're all, I believe they're all tested, at least for the lead piece. I think well, people with wells are tested for other things. Um, but I've got the I've got some um, with the rest. Um, of your 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 um, aid to okay. <laughs> <laughs> David, did David, did you know the answer to that <laughs> question? Could you? Can I shout out to my friend? You absolutely can. I'm my name is David Benner here. I'm the senior positive legal advisor for Commissioner of Health. So the so the Department of Health got a grant in order to provide the testing for for childcare that were on wells. And so they, they test in one tap, we take the testing, but and that allows us all to collect the information so therefore we have surveillance on those. So, so, so the regulations require all all to be tested, but because of that grant you had data on mm -hmm. um, the the folks well, who are on wells. Yes. Um, and, and then your regulation your current regulations. I'm looking at them now. Okay. Your current regulations now say if I'm going to open a child care um, I have to have it tested or something or I have to attest to the, to get a license to get yes. a license you have to, to test license. initially okay and, for initial licensure okay and um, I am remembering something about every three years we I checked with Crystal uh, this morning we do not have a periodicity about this the only folks who are asked to retest are folks who, who test high the first time and then they have to test till they're fine. So we do not have oh, that okay. in our regulations now. But my understanding from <laughs> the law as I read it is that the Department of Health will be developing rules that we'll all uh, consult on and that that's the periodicity will follow after the rules are done. Oh, okay. Because we, we have in, in, in the first draft of these are things we are thinking about in this committee, I think we may have had language in there around not any less protective than what is than around. three years. We don't have any now, and I don't honestly know. I'm looking at my friend in case he knows. Um, I don't know what the science is about uh, if, if you know, does it pop up in? 
uh, in, in water faucets surface, after a yeah. certain period of time. I don't know if there's science around that, but certainly if there's a periodicity that's in the Department of Health rules, we'll follow that and, and we'll just enforce it that way. The only thing I would say at that point is that that would end up being part of doing business for the providers mm -hmm. because we uh, would, in terms of this new law, it's, it is really helpful to us to, have, to be able to have the funding to get all the testing done. The reason that they got that grant for family child care homes was it was new. And we were trying to, you know, help people come on with the new regulations. But the um, sidebar help about this, which we're kind of excited in this instance, is that because we ran it all through their lab, we had all those results. And what we'd like to do for this as well to help with the website and all is now we'll have results for everybody, which will be most helpful. And again, I, I would assume that in the writing of the rules, we'll be investigating what the science is around how things become impacted by lead and what we have to worry about and that we be guided by that. Teresa needs to finish and then we move to Mr. Lead. So um, the, the, re <laughs> the rest of my question was about, um, so people have had to be tested previously and uh, I guess I'm making the assumption that some people were above the levels, although maybe since the level was so high before, maybe not. Do you anticipate there being any issues with people who have had to make remediation on their own dime um, previously, and now theoretically this bill says, oh, but we're going to pay for it now? We've had very few that were higher than the old level. Um, and uh, I don't know. No one's expressed that to okay. us. I think people are generally grateful when they can get assistance to do something that needs to be done. They like to do the right thing. I'm not sure that people would argue that, oh, I had to pay for that before now. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then um, the last part is this uh, the, the bill, I don't, the bill doesn't seem specifically to say this, but it seems like this is what we've heard in testimony is that there would be ongoing. Uh, periodic testing done, um, but that, uh, the funding here really only relates to this initial testing. And so, um, do you have capacity, whether it's an interdepartmental transfer or whatever, to pay for ongoing testing? So. We don't have anything in the budget for that. I'm not sure. I mean, my understanding and reading of the bill is that the, this initial run of testing will be paid for. Whatever periodicity that, that uh, is part of the rules that VDH creates would be the part of the cost of doing business, at least for child care providers. I don't have funding specifically to fund that. So, I mean, occasionally small grants are available for people right. and they could use it for that, but we were not anticipating then that we would do this on that periodicity level. So then theoretically there would be a fee charge to providers to have their water sample tested. I believe that, it's $20 a faucet. Okay. Thank you. Which is not a huge... No, it's 50 Is it 50 It's $20 per test. Per te per te per te per te so you do, the, you, do the, you do the flush, you do the, oh, the right. first so, round of yeah. flush, so, and 50 includes fishing. shipping. Yeah. Right. So that would end up being part of the cost of doing that. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanted to clarify, prior to this all happening, your action level was 15 parts per million, correct? Yes, my, our current action level but is 15 now, parts now per million. Be five. It will be five with, whatever, with the law. And what I will tell you is that uh, for many years, center-based programs have tested their water, and we've never, it's always just been part of the cost of setting up your business, right? We, we haven't previously ever paid for it. We paid for family child care homes because we got a grant, and it was one of the things we could do for them to help them meet some of the new regulations. We didn't pay for centers at that time because they had they'd always had that obligation, and they always paid for themselves. Based on the information you have. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Lead goes first, and then go first. Okay. Uh, yeah, all of a sudden now. Uh, uh, <laughs> data, the list of, you said you had uh, a number of uh, home-based systems tested. 
during this period. Have mm -hmm. we seen the data or the, what the statistics were on that? We did yeah. see that already. Yeah. Yes, it's in, the, schools, it's in the right? testimony I I gave you last time I was here. Okay, all right. I just I knew March we twenty seventh. Hmm? March twenty seventh. Yeah, but it it looked like a very low number at any real problem. Fourteen. That's that sort of high. Even point. at the point, even at the five parts per billion. Yeah. There were it was a very small number that would have had. That's what I just wanted to. Fourteen That was my question. <laughs> and those will, would be the folks. I know um, what Chris is working on right now, A, she's working with the Department of Health on, you know, preparing for some of the other things. She's also working on the list of, um, because public programs would be included with their schools, so she's working on, um, you know, she's sorting a list of who's a public program, who's a private program. They're looking at who's open during the summer and closed during the summer. Of course, they'll start with who's open during the summer. And we'll look at anyone who tested high the first time that we know of and go to those folks first. Like, we'll, we'll sort of um, prioritize our process through the group. Kelly? I was the same question that Clara was asking. There you go. Great one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there is a vice for the committee. There is a, a desire that whatever is in place for school is in place for child care facilities. I appreciate that. Um, and that so if there are, whether it is um, how much the state, how much we are, how much we collectively are going to be putting forth as opposed to the entities themselves in terms of um, what is the criteria in terms of the testing, retesting? Um, one, we want parity, but two, it really is right now the difference between pre K and child care is where does the money come from? And um, our understanding when we were doing the child care bill, when I said we can't talk about pre K, um, that we, we learned that there are, in fact, some privately run, private, not private, privately run zero to four or five um, contracted, I mean, they're, they're in a school building, but they're not provided, but it's not the, the they yes. rent space or they're There's given some space or whatever. school buildings. Yes. Some have, but the and, licensee is not the school. Right. Okay, yes. thank you. That's much clearer. Yes. And so yes. um, it begins to get fuzzy if we begin, if we go down the road of making um, differences, because they're all children, and we're very concerned about children no matter where they are. So we want the children to be treated the same. Yes, thank you. That parity, I think, will be important. Are there other amendments that we think we're going to be discussing? Because my goal committee is whatever gets six votes on Thursday is out the door. <laughs> hey, because because then it's appropriate because it has to go to another committee. And I keep hearing from everyone that this is we need to act quickly. Well, sorry, we got till June. Then. Uh, yeah, well, there's another committee. And we don't listen to We don't listen to us were here until <laughs> June last year. We'd yeah. like to not repeat that. Yeah. The, I mean, the, only, the only thing that, you know, in going yeah. along with what you were talking about in terms of parity is, is it, it would be helpful to understand a little bit more why, you know, this 454 versus the, I'm presuming that 454 replacement fixture would be similar to the all other outlets fixture in the public schools. And I, I just don't know if there's a reason, a real reason, to have a separate thing. Why don't we just do everybody the same? Look, I think that's what we were saying we were going to do. Yeah, no. I mean, and I know, I, I know that what people are going to say is that the fixtures in, um, in school buildings are fancier or more extensive or they're different than the fixtures in your home. Is that what you're going to say? Well, then that, no. would, mean, that would mean that the daycare centers 
should be less. Oh, this is because all the outlets is 319. Right. Well, but didn't you? Okay, yes. Sorry, this is still David. Um, the 454 was actually, so John Kat is correct. It's actually more at the idea being that it, it, it is likely that schools would have facilities for people to do that work. For the four, I'm not advocating, I'm just explaining the rationale. My understanding is that 454 was to account for the labor that a private person would have to hire. And so I guess we would need then some um, language from you or Stephanie or whoever figured this part out. Because what I'm understanding, mm -hmm. people in this committee wanting is that outlets used for cooking, um, or you know, something, and then maybe we can. Yeah. I mean, because that is that is assuming one kind, not the not the other kind of fixtures. Okay. So the, yeah, so that's fair. These numbers didn't come from health. Okay. And the a, a number. More, more child care programs now have industrial kitchens because okay, any newly built facilities, particularly um, facilities uh, serving meals, you know, are building industrial kitchens. Many of the current child centers have them, many of the head starts have them. So more and more of them do have the industrial kind of fixtures for cooking. Tend to be a little newer, maybe, than what you might find in a school, so we might not have issues with them. We're not assuming we'll have issues with every single faucet. In homes, you'd see more of a standard kitchen faucet for cooking. And again, though, I think to James's point, um, some of these replacements may not cost as much, but it could be that um, it's a total cost of not just the fixture itself, but the uh, yeah, the labor to go into the fixture. Some folks might fix it themselves. I would never touch plumbing in my own home. <laughs> uh, Sandy and yeah. Kelly. So the numbers that we're looking at on the screen are those. Is that a seventy percent of a hundred percent of another number? Yes. Okay. Seventy percent. Um, so I asked Stephanie to. <clears throat> run some numbers as if we had we were having child care providers um, reimbursed the same way as schools. And I think I forwarded the email to Julie over the weekend, but if I did not do it right now, <laughs> I may not have. Um, Other side of the 454 is about 132. Um, it's, um, she sent it to every, all of us on email. Maybe oh. you could post it. Email? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but when did you send it by email? I just sent she, it by she email. Just, just now. She just sent it by email to all of us. Um, and what did she send it? I'm sorry. Um, Kelly, figures. Um, Kelly um, asked joint fiscal to um, to run cost numbers you. based on the number of job care providers that they were working with. Do we know what she's calculating for them? So she she used the same percentage of how many fixtures um, would be drinking fountains, um, kitchen, and other, and it was the same breakdown that they used for schools, so there's a lot of assuming <coughs> in those numbers, but they, she ran numbers as if child care facilities were going to be reimbursed at the same level and in the same way as schools. So, um, um, since you have that open, if you could forward that to the two people right here. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh huh. That's it. And, 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 uh -huh. um, because. Yeah. One. I'm sorry, I didn't think to. That's okay. And I mean, what I mean, um, if we open up our email, they are there right now, folks. Um, if I recall, it had both at a hundred percent as well as at seventy percent. Yes, we are still. Yes, that is also true. That. Um, and then the question would be, um, 
uh, if if B was to take into consideration that um, a child care provider might be less likely than a public school to have someone on, on site whose job it is for maintenance and so could do plumbing. So if the B was to provide that little extra right for the for doing that, is that do we use that same little extra for all the others? don't own the building where they are, yes. but they rent. Mm -hmm. And so um, is this something that will never happen? But um, what happens if the owner of the building goes, yeah, I don't want to do this. It's always possible that a landlord would say that. What we generally do with providers who have to move is we work with them to move, to find another spot to move. In terms of, you know, recent history, we don't need to go back ten minutes. Um, in terms of regulations, whether maybe it's fences or space, something, um, have there been places where, have there been childcare um, providers who have had to move from where they are, not because they're having more kids, but because the site where they're at no longer meets the requirements. And so, have you had, have you been, have been successful? And did that ever happen? In my memory, most of the programs we've moved in the last few years have had to do with either uh, the safety of the environment, you know, something like environmental toxins or something of that nature um, or uh, you know damage flooding oh, okay. uh, you so, know other mold uh, has happened on more than one occasion that uh, I actually think Katie testified about the mold that they found in Ascension um, that's very concerning with young children and so usually people want out as quick as they can so we work with them we help them find other locations sometimes they move in uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we get them, we work with them to try to move without disruption of service. We, we have a little bit of familiarity. I don't know if you remember a couple years back, there was a, um, I don't know that it got as far as you, it became such a big deal as people thought it would. They were looking at brown sites and there was infected intersect with child care programs and old dry cleaning sites. And we were very anxious and we um, went in and uh, we had a whole plan ready. And I remember the governor being very concerned. We were like, no, no, we know how to move programs. Like, if we find stuff, we'll help them move. Okay. Fortunately, we didn't find many. But it is something we're prepared to do, and, and we've done before. Mm -hmm. But so, okay. And again, I, I, I have to look to David for this, but I believe landlords have some responsibility around lead in in, in the properties they own, in rented properties, um, because, you know, that's, a, that's an issue. We also worry about kids who are, you know, renters in their homes. Are there other ideas, questions that we want Riva to be? aware of. <laughs> so Reba, when we pass it and it says it's a hundred percent, not seventy, not fifty, where are you going to find it in your budget? Well, in terms of remediation, I believe 
the text <coughs> covers everything, at least in the bill that I read. Is that, is that right? So I believe the testing is covered. Um, there is language I saw in the Budget Adjustment Act, which has not been fully signed, and I don't know the status of it, um, that uh, the money that you gave back, the 2.5 million, there was 300,000 set aside for remediation in that, in the BAA that I saw. So that was 300,000. Um, and so the question is, are there, does this cover costs? Oh, if you say you want 100 just for childcare, I'm, maybe I'm not following the question. Instead of the 70, 30, we said 100%. Oh, I, I am presuming that you, I am presuming that the, um, oh, so child care would now mean CD, whatever you call it, Child Development Division, would be responsible for the remediation costs of not only child care facilities, but also public schools? No, we would do only child care facilities. So who's going to be doing? Well, the bill will determine that, right? Uh -huh. The S S forty came out of House Education would pay for seven percent of everybody. The Department of Health will, and I believe I said this the other day, the Department of Health will disperse funds. Whatever funds allocated to the General Assembly, we will disperse funds consistent with that requirement. <laughs> So if the general assembly provides 100 percent we'll disperse 100 percent through our partners at CBD. If it's 70, we'll do 70, whatever that number is. But if the bill, the bill coming out does provide for it for both that's what I thought. Both species at 70%. And if the right, right. And the, the Department of Health will be dispersing the money to the child development division and the local um, schools. schools. How, what, whatever makes sense in, 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 in terms of the in terms of the ministerial act of the disbursement of funds, we we'll work with CDD to, to see what makes the most sense. So either we will transfer those funds to CDD, or we will work with them to to provide to, to cut the checks for recipients of remediation funds. <laughs> you look unsatisfied. <laughs> you look unsatisfied. No, no, I, I'm not unsatisfied. I'm what it, nope, I'm not going to ask any more questions, like, um, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> e either way, whether you use a set amount or whether you decide to do some kind of an invoice, because we have a system and a process to pay child care providers, I would assume the easiest thing would be for them to give us the money and us to keep track of those records and to run it through our regular payment system. But we would work with BBH on whatever worked. I mean, that feels like a big burden to you when um, and is we make a number of small payments. Um, is a child care facility the Boys and Girls Club or the um, YWCA or whatever who are um, organizations, or, you know, Sarah Holbrook said, who have not, who maybe what they have more of is the third space. School age kids. School age kids. Yes. They're they're a part of this set unless they're operated by a public school. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So when I asked this question about what were the differences between the numbers from C D D and the numbers that Stephanie was using in her estimates, mm -hmm. she did write back to me to let me know that she, her numbers do not include third space after school. Oh, she didn't include after school. Oh, I thought it might be because she wasn't including people located in public schools. Um, that is that well. was my guess. That was oh. as well. I'll find okay. her email here. Okay, so um, um, we would still care about after school kids drinking lead in Columbus mm -hmm. water, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, my and some of them are only in kindergarten. I, I mean, my, it's my, you can have my understanding in terms of our concern about lead in drinking water is that it goes from zero to to a hundred. 
of the age of the person because not only are we concerned about young children who are most at risk Yes. But we are we are concerned about their brothers and sisters, and we're concerned then about the teachers, and the teachers who um, might be pregnant, or just the teachers in general. And so, if we're going to be, we should also then be concerned with the after-school things. We so, have been assuming that after-school programs are included. Okay. So, could you email Stephanie and ask her to please do a rerun? Well, I'm just rereading this sentence. Oh. I did not include after school programs or licensed pre K programs that are provided in the public school. So if that clause provided in the public school applies also to the after school, I'll just clarify with her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that makes sense because the schools are already checked. And like Sarah Colbrook is also probably checked as a child care center. Which they do child care. Um, well, it, that, I, mean, I mean, I guess my question on this is Sarah Holbrook and the YWCA or YMCA, whatever they are, and um, King Street, or whatever. There may be um, places where they have both well, a cute little childcare, and then they may have different spaces in the building, which is the after school. And so, which ones would be tested? And so we that would be testing new... all of them. So we ask them where care is provided, and now under this law, any of those places we'd be testing. Anywhere that care is provided, it, you, you must, under the current regulations, designate to us where the children will be in any larger facilities. So we know what their footprint for child care is. We know what bathrooms they use. We know if there's um, bubblers, is what we used to call it, where I come from. Or water fountains. fountains, we call it here. <laughs> if there's water fountains, like all of that is known as part of the licensing process. So, I mean, and some of these questions will may or may not impact our, um, our collective decision of at least six of what is the financial distribution. And in, um, in a center-based child care and preschool program, um, they are able to, under that license, serve children up to the age of 13, right? So many of them have after-school programs for K-1-2 within their building under that same license, mm -hmm. and the school age provisions are in there. Um, very few of the programs would hold two separate licenses for after school and center-based care, unless the only, really, after school programs are only doing after school. And they're doing- Is there such an animal? Yes, there's an after school license, which is only after school, which is kids enrolled in kindergarten, to act, I think sick goes up to 16. And family child care homes, of course, can have the entire range. Mm -hmm. So, I, um, can you speak up? Yeah. I missed a little bit, and I apologize if you've already okay. answered this, but I was curious, what would you say? Do you think it's important that we cover 100% of um, child care centers when they find, for remediation, when they find out that they've got a problem? You I think cover 100% of the facilities or cover 100% of the cost? 100% of the cost. I think they would appreciate having 100% of the cost covered. Because for some it would be a hardship. So right now we're just talking about fixtures. In the maybe likely scenario that there will be places that have other communication needs, are we then talking about 100% of those costs as well? Or are we just... Like the place I'm not, I'm not sure of the question. Well, right now, we're only talking about reimbursing for the remediation of fixtures. Mm -hmm. There may or may not be places that need to be replaced. Or, so if that pops up, that's not accounted for here. If we're talking 100% reimbursement at cost, and I know that's not mm -hmm. the bill, but very different numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so is sticking with fixtures the proven um, way to go? That's what the bill is about. The bill right. is about fixtures. I mean, is the bill about fixtures or is the bill about protecting children from lead poisoning? It's about fixtures. <laughs> 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 
You want to protect children, but it's only going to be done through the fixture. Through the fixture. So, should we phone a friend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just, I mean, if there's an old home, let's say, 100-year-old home that happened to be a daycare center, they still may have buried in the ground their connection to a well or a water system that's a lead pipe. So that would be an additional remediation, okay? Now, presumably, that would be few and far between, but there probably some exist out there in older homes. So I think that's what somebody was getting at. There could be further remediation, you know, Required in, in some homes. I doubt it would be in any schools. There, there could be. It is ex based on our surveillance. It's mm -hmm. extremely unlikely. Yeah. It's extremely unlikely. Good. Good. And if they did, that's their problem. <laughs> so and you have those screens. Yes, and you have those screens. If we had a program that had a right. serious problem and and was in danger of closing. Right. Due to remediation for lead, we could invoke the, 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 those grants, yeah, the supplemental grants. So sticking uh, James, then Logan. Oh, <laughs> I, I was first before. I thought you called. And we, no, go just, so for your information. <laughs> okay, no, excuse me. <laughs> we generally negotiate with programs um, for those grants. Some programs. Um, will take some of it as a no interest loan that they actually pay back through their subsidy over time. So we try to stretch the money a little bit and we look at sort of what the cause of it was and they have to have a sustainability plan. This would be a little bit more straightforward, but we, we work with them. We do, we do work with them. My question was back to our friend, um, which was, so do you believe that the legislation as it reads right now, is really remediation is about fixtures and not about. Are we making a commitment if we say 100% to fixtures and anything else that's found? So my read of S40 it is about fixtures because our experience with the pilot and, and, and doing the surveillance with the licensed childcare is that the problem is not is not pipes that that 100% of the folks that, that did remediation by means of fixture replacement achieved mm -hmm. what, what, we, what we hoped, which was extremely low levels. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, James, Brogan, <coughs> and Sandy. I guess it's already been covered. I was just going to um, second what, what are really, uh, not second, but uh, bounce off what Kelly said is we can make it either pipes or say fixtures. Yeah, it's just fixtures. Yeah. Right. Or something. Yeah. 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 It seems like it is fixtures. So she called them, yes, I want to say it. It was already answered. <laughs> okay. Logan, Sandy. I think you already sort of covered it, but my, my, my question was just the conversation that we had last week about. Do you have any protections in place for people? I would assume it's a problem that's not very common, but for people in a family child care home that get remediated and then uh, you know stop their their child care. Protections in terms of getting them back. Uh, yeah, protections in terms of like just getting that that grant money and then just getting out of the business. Well, when we're when we do the supplemental grants, we actually it, it is a sort of long process about whether or not they're staying in business or getting out, right? And if they're getting out, we sometimes help them hang on long enough to give families notice. If they're staying in, they actually have a sustainability plan that we expect them to. Act. And most of the ones that have gotten grants for to stay in business have managed to stay in business. So is it? We actually not many family child care homes access it. It's mostly center based programs who, who encounter financial difficulties. 
Sandy Tapper, then Carl. So we've been, we've been hypothesizing about the bad pipes, but in fact, the child care centers that you currently regulate have all had a, at least one water test, and, and one would assume that if the problem is in the pipes, that we might already know that. Mm -hmm. That is our Then that, was, that was my question. We already know what the, the you know. And, and, if, and if that happens, it's going to have to be more than those right. figures. If because if do. centers had above, and again, we don't have the same detail, level of detailed data that we have on the homes, but if centers were above the 15 parts per billion, they would not be able to use water in their center until that was remediated. Under, car, under the current mm -hmm. rule. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember anyone who's had that for lead in my mm -hmm. memory. That's not, to me, it never happened. But I don't recall that. Mm -hmm. And I usually get briefed on those issues. It's usually some other weird substance. Well, we don't, we're not worried about it. We're not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, but not right now. <laughs> we're being very well, no, we remediate for them. Uh, uh, Carl. Yeah, I guess I'd suggest that we just narrow it down to, if it doesn't say it, that it's just the fixtures that we're trying to <laughs> deal with in this bill. And that if I understand it properly, there could be some special grant money or something available for people that might need further remediation outside of this bill. Yes, and there's true? also a very small grant program at the Community Loan Fund that family child care providers avail themselves of more. It's a small amount of money, um, but it's for sm small projects like mm -hmm. that. That's that's why they, they don't usually end up with us for the larger issues. And we, you know, we talk to them as well. <clears throat> no, just, I'm, I'm still having a hard time understanding if I saw those, well, they just disappeared off my screen. But anyway, the 70%, the 100%, and was there any money in the bill that I presumably voted against? Okay, all right. <laughs> No, you voted against the budget, she said. No, 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 you, no, you voted for, if there was any money, you voted for the money. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, I'd like to see what, what that juxtaposition is. Was there any money that prior, you know, voted for this? How much we're saying we have to do now at the 70 um, percent? I, um, I will get clarity by Friday, or by Thursday, when we yeah. take this up and when we take action. Um, on Friday, um, or Thursday, whenever, whatever, what is it? Thursday. Thursday, when we take action on Thursday. Uh, my understanding in the budget adjustment, there's what, 400,000 or something? That, that's what I... That was my understanding, that there was 400,000 in the budget adjustment, and when what the Senate sent over was a little bit more than that. And what the um, House Ed <laughs> sent up to us was even a little bit more than that. <laughs> Or actually, I'm not sure what the sense sent over anything because they're not sending over anything with money. But um, I, I, I will um, I will get that information for you um, from appropriations or joint fiscal in terms of very clear. Um, but I do. I mean, I I, I want to say this bill and the money part. I mean, I think we want to give our the recommendations of the majority of this committee in terms of um, the money, but also this other sort of policy issues around what we want to add or subtract or around fixtures and stuff like that. Um, we have eight or nine possible things that we could do between now um, and the end of the session um, that I know are priorities for various people and they're large bills that won't necessarily come to us, but for instance that we're going to take up a, a piece of it at 3.30 which has significant pieces that um, we in the past have been interested in. Um, so we could spend all the rest of the time on this, or we could do the best we can um, and take action on Thursday. So what I would ask from each of you um, is it ideas about amendments, about changes. Make sure that. Um, well, we have one. Here. We have one. Get them done. Get them done. Get them done. 
so that we can go through them and um, exactly. do that. And then, of course, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and we might not get it. But that's my goal. So we bring those on Thursday. Is bring those on Thursday. Have them have them drafted by okay. the council. Yeah, send it to Mike. Send it send it to Mike O'Grady. Have him draft you. You know, for you and and let's put it all on the table because there's some really good ideas. There's some things that have come out, and then there are things that we may, you know. This will, let's just create something that um, the majority of the committee feels comfortable moving over to appropriations. Okay? And I will, I will try to get the clarity in terms of, um, Carl, your question about what money <laughs> have we already voted for? What, what money have we already voted for? What's in question? And what, yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we have six minutes before we get to do look at what um, is in the minimum wage bill related to CCFAP. Um, thank you. Hi, folks. Do you, the two of you want to come together or how? Um, we are now changing. We're being oh so flexible today and changing subjects. Um, uh, and Damien, our interest, I think, he knows, um, but it's not, um, and we're and saying this as much for the committee as well. We are not right now. Today, what we're focusing on is what does S23 say about CCFAP, and what did we say about CCFAP in the bill that we passed, and where are they the same, where are they different? And then I guess we're going to drag um, um, Deb. Deb Brighton over to talk about the money part or whatever, whatever she did. Okay. Um, do you want a reminder of what you did first, or would you like the minimum? Well, you know that it, it's all. Thank you for that very thoughtful offer. <laughs> <laughs> And we always do what Ledge Council suggests. Gently. <laughs> 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 Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council. Damian Leonard, Office of Legislative Council. So this is H531 as passed the House. And there are two sections that amended the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, which I refer to as CCFAP. Um, so the first section that we're looking at is Section 2, and this was in the green books. This was the ongoing language. So first at the bottom of page two and the sorry, the bottom of page one and the top of page two, the committee chose to kind of flip this sentence to say it in the positive and also um, to allow uh, somebody who's currently unemployed to receive CCFAP for three months instead of one month. So now each family seeking employment shall be entitled to participate in the program for up to three months, and the commissioner may further extend that period. In subdivision two, this committee had a conversation about uh, using language referring to current federal poverty guidelines so that we're always um, staying current. And then there's a sentence added at the end of that subdivision that said, if the federal poverty guidelines decrease in a given year, the division is to maintain the previous years federal poverty guidelines for the purpose of determining eligibility and benefit amount. So we're never going back. We're only staying as we are moving forward. And then subdivision A4 was added, and this is to recognize um, that currently some centers or programs are receiving a payment um, through CCFAP that's higher than what they are charging for tuition. So this language is saying that the excess um, of the usual customer of the usual and customary rate for services um, can't continue after September 30th of 2021. Then section three, this was session law because it only pertains to fiscal year 2020. Uh, this is the appropriation of 1.25 that's um, restoring the base, and then an additional 6.9 is appropriated for CCFAP. And there are two moving <coughs> parts in this section. Subdivision A is the moving part around the sliding fee scale, and subdivision A2 
has to do with increasing the market rates. So first and one with regard to the sliding fee scale, um, we're saying that we're ensuring that families whose gross income is up to 100% of current FPL receive 100% of the available benefit. That's maintaining the status quo. And that families whose gross income is between 100 and 300% of FPL guidelines receive between 99 and 10% of the available financial assistance benefit. And then we use this language at the top of the paragraph, I guess the bottom of the paragraph, right before um, line A, scaling between the set eligibility levels as follows. So that's important because A through D sets um, certain points um, on a graph and tells you what the corresponding benefit is to that FPL level at each of those spots along the graph. Um, but the scaling indicates that um, in between each of those points on the graph, um, there's, there's some movement in the benefit level. Um, so 95% of available financial assistance benefit for families at 125% of the federal poverty guidelines, 75% 70, benefit at 150% of FBL, 50% benefit at 200% FBL, and 10% benefit at 300% FPL. So that's the sliding fee scale portion. And then this subdivision two has to do with the market rates. So the second part is aligning market rates uh, of reimbursement for preschool and school aged children in fiscal year 2020 with the market rates reported in the 2015 market rate survey and maintaining rates of reimbursement for infants and toddlers um, at the 2017 market rate levels for fiscal year 2020. And that's it. So we, we did it vis-a-vis -vis the federal poverty level and market rate. Mm -hmm. These are changes proposed by the Senate to our... No, yeah. this is <coughs> H531 as is what passed. passed. Okay. Yep. This is what you reported. We report. How many reported this section? This is just a reminder of what happened in the House. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, Damien, before you continue, let me ask um, Reba, how many and how, what has been um, the take up, for lack of a better term, of the um, change in policy that we passed two years ago? around you can keep the same level if you get a raise as long as you put that money in a um, child savings account or, or um, a retirement. I'll check with Ann. I don't think it's been very high, but I will check. I'll check. I'll okay. Now, now has that not been very high because we're still rolling it out and um, people don't know and people are not um, aware of it and then how do we make people aware of it? I think people don't have uh, money. People aren't putting raises into savings accounts. Okay. They're using it. Okay. That's what we're hearing. But then you okay. could use their child care. That was the whole reason they did it is that they would get the money and that would put them just a few dollars over maybe and then all of a sudden they lose their child care. So that's the clip. I mean, right. Well, so, so they wouldn't be able to keep, they wouldn't probably be keeping the money because it would mean less money in their pocket. So that's what I think the chair is asking is who has taken advantage Let of that. Let me check with that. I mean, we've had I mean maybe, maybe what we will be finding out is that it is too complicated for people to figure out. So, uh, so what's in the minimum wage bill right now is language that was, this is almost identical to what passed in the minimum wage bill that was vetoed last biennium. Uh, and so what this provides is that to the extent funds are appropriated, uh, the child care financial assistance program uh, would adjust the sliding scale. Um, of the benefits to correspond with each minimum wage increase required pursuant to the, the minimum wage bill. 
um, so that the benefit percentage at each new minimum wage level would not be lower than the percentage applied under the former minimum wage. So the problem that this is addressing is there's currently uh, what everyone refers to as the benefits cliff, which is a point where your cumulative loss of benefits uh, outstrips your increase in income. And the concern was is that in the out years of the minimum wage proposal, you would inadvertently push people over the edge of that. And so this is shifting out the, the sliding fee scale for the benefits, um, pushing it out to correspond with each minimum wage increase so that we don't inadvertently push people down that slope. The second piece is to adjust the rate paid to providers on behalf of families in a manner that offsets the estimated increased cost of childcare in Vermont resulting from the increases in the minimum wage required to pursue into this act. So again, this is dealing with the other side of it. So providers have a number of workers who are receiving less than $15 an hour. So it's anticipated that those providers will need to increase their payroll to meet the new minimum wage requirements and this would increase their overhead costs. And so what this is doing is uh, increasing the rate that's paid to them to offset those increases uh, so that they're, to the extent they're receiving uh, CCFAP subsidies, that those increases are offset. So, in the, where, where is the, I mean, the current system that has been in place for however many years uses some version of the federal poverty level as the percentage of what you get for CCFAP and some version of the market rate to what is um, the other half of that equation. Mm -hmm. This, as I am understanding it, which may not be at all, throws that out or does it layer on where, where where does the I mean, where does this, where does the min, where does the calculation of the minimum wage come into play vis-a-vis -vis the, the federal poverty level? Sure. So, I believe that this is more of a layer, and because it's silent, it leaves it to DCF to figure out what um, by what amount. Uh, the, the sliding fee scale would have to shift in order to maintain the status quo for families, to make them no worse off for having um, been impacted by the minimum wage than, than prior. So they'd be receiving um, an equivalent amount in terms of their benefit. But it doesn't specify, it doesn't do the calculation here. It leaves it to DCF to, to figure out the accurate amount. Now, we're not at the 2019 market rate, correct? 2017 for infants and toddlers. <coughs> and 2008 plus 3%. And the bill proposed to 27. 20, 2017 20, for everybody else. 2015 for pre-sales. So, um, does this, is this layered in terms of two? Mm -hmm. Is this layered on the 2017 or 2015 market rate? It doesn't specify. And so it therefore would be you meant to layer on whatever the existing um, market rate that's being used. So the impact would be different our bill passes, then it our bill does pass. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we don't really know the answer to any mm -hmm. of these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless, I know, so unless 531 okay. passes or doesn't handle it. Right. Well, I, I mean, I guess, I mean, what I mean, if it's layered, if it's layered on, um, we are, we're behind. We have been behind. We raised it up. But in terms of the year of the market rate, mm -hmm. and we figured out, much to our sadness, that we could not bring it all the way up to the most current, which is two years old anyway, right, in terms of how they figure mm -hmm. things out. Mm -hmm. 
this is going to um, what is this going to do? Because every two years, mm -hmm. I mean, every two years the market rate, I presume, increases. Yeah, you going to say something? No, right? I, I, I can. Okay. I mean, right doesn't, I mean, is, is it fair to say that when you do the survey every, that the market rate is increasing? Um, Weaver, if you deputy commission for child development um, in the Department of Children and Families. Last year when we were talking to folks about this bill, my understanding was that this clause was about making families no worse off. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that we would look at where a family was before the minimum wage, went up and uh, adjust so that those families would be no worse off than they were at that point. Not way better off and suddenly part in the market rate, just no work that a family would not go backwards. I believe, I, Deb has done a lot of, it's complicated because <coughs> as you know, federal poverty level goes by um, family size. Right. Right, so um, minimum wage doesn't adjust for family size, so you have to kind of adjust for that. We also have very few uh, dual earning families for reasons you saw in presentations, so pretty much it's single parents who'd be feeling this impact. Um, but my understanding was that the language was designed to make a family no worse off, and we would be looking to make them no worse off with each minimum wage adjustment. So we look at what it was before it went into effect, whatever year or whatever, and what percent benefit they got, and we'd adjust to make sure that wherever they landed after the wage adjustment, that somehow or other we'd make sure nobody lost benefit, of their percent of benefit, but it wouldn't necessarily make the benefit better. It didn't solve the problem that you attempted to right. solve. Right, so it's, it's not solving the goal is not to fill the, the hole. It was just to ensure that people weren't being pushed down the slope as a result of the minimum wage bill. Um, the, and it's, it's important to note here that this bill raises the minimum wage. So we're in 2019 right now. There's a wage increase in 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024. So there are five times when this would have to, things would have to shift under this bill. And so it's it's both trying to make sure that individuals are no worse off or the families are no worse off. And it's also trying to mitigate some of the pressure to the extent that employers get that their market rate, uh, that they're getting CCFAP benefits um, from families that are affected by this. Obviously the providers may have you know, 20 families and only eight of them are getting CCFAP, so they'll have to raise rates for other families to compensate for the increase in wages. But it is, that's trying to uh, kind of mitigate the impact there so that you don't have providers say, great, the families are no worse off, but I'm still getting a fixed amount, and so now I have to do a double increase on the other families to compensate for that. So. It's somewhat similar to what you're asking. If I'm, a, I'm in a family that's getting 100%, mm -hmm. and uh, the federal poverty, because I get the raise, I go over, over the federal poverty rate. Mm -hmm. That seems to me that instead of me getting 100%, I might end up getting 95% or lower. So I don't think this fixes that. Yeah. It puts me personally in a different category um, can, about how much so, I'm going to so, get. So I think what it's saying is that when you get that raise, right. no matter what happens, you're going to get the same benefit of 100%. Well, then we got to say that. We have, we, you just can't automatically because the other bill says, certain, if you make a certain amount of money, you get 100%. If you get a pay raise, now you may not be in the 100% category of the federal poverty level. Only, you, you, know, 
for this bill to say no one's going to get hurt. Well, We've got to say somewhere. Th that this is not saying no one's going to get hurt. This I, I don't think this is this is saying that if I was making minimum wage on January first, mm -hmm. or if I was make, getting minimum wage on December thirtieth, yeah, and um, on January first when the new bump up comes, yeah. um, I'm making more money and that might kick me off of 100% poverty level. Mm -hmm. um, that I would still get 100%. As long as I'm making minimum, still making minimum wage. It's right. just a new minimum Not wage. lower than the percentage applied before. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. So I did do a quick calculation only for a family size of three, mm -hmm. just looking at the provisions of H-531. Um, and even before, uh, just by the chain, the changes in the sliding fee scale that Katie just described, and moving to 2015, none of the families affected in 20 and 21 would have a copay any longer. It would be a, they'd all be at a, they'd all be getting a full benefit, so they'd be better off than they are now. They'd be better off. It sort of becomes a moot point. They no longer have a cost sharing. So they'd be, 531 makes them so much better that this becomes a moot point. Um, just with, before the redesign for the first two years, when you go to the redesign, um, none, of the, none of the families, um, except the ones earning $15 an hour have any copay at all. And the folks earning $15 an hour, this is for a family size of three, would be at $25 a week. Right now, they would be at $94 a week. So essentially, 531 makes this language less necessary. If it passes, that's the tricky part. So I think I understand how this affects mother and child, but I don't understand paragraph two. What does that require exactly? So I'm a, I'm a child care provider, and and I now have to pay Jessica 50 cents more than I did yesterday. And what happens? So in paragraph two, this is reflecting the fact that the cost of child care will probably be increasing as minimum wage increases, because as we heard from testimony, um, the wages of child care providers are, are probably below current minimum wage. But what does that do? What, what does Rita have to do for me? So this says that not only is the the sliding fee scale um, going to be sliding over, but also the the market rates um, will be increasing to correspond uh, with the increase in minimum wage, so that um, the the difference between what um, a family is paying and what the tuition is isn't growing. <coughs> is the assumption is the assumption that child care providers are paying their staff or paying themselves the current all they are paying is the min, what's the current minimum wage now ten something ten seventy eight so they um that the, they are being paid ten dollars and seventy eight dollars cents an hour. So the, the understanding is that the average wage for child care providers is below $15. I, I, so I, that's, that's, that's in the year 2024. I'm, we are sequential. We're, we're doing this in little steps. Right. So the, the understanding is there are some who are getting minimum wage. There are others who are getting more than $15. But because the average is below that $15 currently and far enough below that inflation isn't necessarily going to close that gap, there, the assumption is that you're going to have a portion of child care workers swept up in the minimum wage increases, which will drive up the, the cost for the providers. There's also the question of wage compression. And so as you take someone who's earning $15.50, and then you have to bring everyone else up to 15, uh, they may want to make more, the, the provider may want to pay them a little bit more, so you end up having some pressure there. 
uh, not just for workers who are earning below the $15 threshold or whatever the threshold's gonna be over the years. I think the right now the average wage is like $12 and something, but there you go. You guys know better than I do. Um, so the average wage for this year is above minimum wage. If, it is. If, if there, no one gets a raise next year, it will be 1271. And under this bill, what would be the minimum wage per hour next year? So if we go back uh, to section one here, the minimum wage is going to step up to 1150, which means that if the average wage is 1271, it's still it's still it's low. so then I mean when yeah. when is it if no one ever gets a raise, no when one, does it become higher than 1222? Yeah, it'll be 2022. It'll exceed the the average minimum wage, but the thing to so keep why in are mind you doing is now? because they're because it's an average you will have some employees who will see their wages go up and you'll see some pressure. They're pushing other wages up in the industry. So, um, it, and that, that's kind of the, what you're looking at is, because it's an average, there are employees who are making a lot more than 1271 and there are some who are making a lot less. And the question is, for those employees who are making less, are they making less than the 1150 that it, it's supposed to hit next year? Um, which is conceivable, and so then you start to have that upward pressure, and then providers start to feel more of a pinch with their bottom line trying to, to do this. So that's what that piece is put in there for, um, because we've, in the committees that have been hearing this, they've been hearing from both the, the child care providers and then groups like the VNAs and so forth saying, Company. That. <laughs> She's been so <laughs> waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> they, they've been hearing from, from these groups saying that not all of our workers make minimum wage, but we have some workers who are at the minimum wage, and so as soon as this starts going up, if we're stuck getting a fixed subsidy, it's going to make it even harder for us to continue to provide the services that we're being asked to provide right now. I, I, and I'm going to ask a child care question. <laughs> I know you're surprised. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so um, back on the provision, paragraph number two, that talks about the rates paid to providers and the adjustments <coughs> of those rates. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, DCF does a market rate survey approximately every two years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the there are adjustments to rates paid, and we only pay it two, uh, three quarters of 100% of the market rate or something like that? The 75th percentile. Yeah. Which is what 75% of providers charge. Charge. Yes. Okay. So, um, so would the current procedure that we have in place satisfy the intent of number two? So this isn't tied to the most recent market survey. This is tied to the market rate that DCF is using. Um, because it was statutorily required or otherwise. Um, but it's not, every time there's a new survey, the, this language isn't tied to, to, the, to the most recent survey. It's right. tied to the rate that's being used. Right, so I, just, so I guess what I'm saying is that as, as the minimum wage changes, if this bill is passed, then that will be reflected in the market rate survey that's done. Oh, I see. Okay. And so is that reflection of what providers are now paying and then charging, um, and the reflection of that in the current procedure that we use for market rate surveys mm -hmm. um, sufficient to meet the intent of that language? Or do we need to do some, or would this language require us to do some additional adjustment beyond what we would already perhaps do with a market rate survey mm -hmm. that takes into consideration those increased rates already? Do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand what you're saying, and I don't have a, a great answer. I think um, I would have to talk to Reba about, how, or maybe Deb would have to, to look at that even. Um, well, I, I almost flip your question, Teresa, and yeah. say, you. I believe I heard you saying, Katie, that in H531, there's some language about staying current with the market rate survey, which we've never no, actually, no, there's no. not. It's so no currency with the market rate survey would salt, would again make that not necessary. Because if we're using a market rate methodology, 
and the market goes up because they're paying providers more and we follow them, yeah. you that would meet the intent of this right. um, no, of this rule. FPL if we don't stay if we don't keep up with the market rate, um, then again we get sort of providers will get caught in the middle of that and families as well. Um, and then uh, yes, so I think we don't really have a clear answer about that. The, the language said about keeping up was with the FPL. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, remaining current with that. And we couldn't, I mean, we would do that, but we don't, it would, 2000, even going from 15 to 17 was going to be too much. Yeah. Um, so then my other is just a, an editorial comment that I love the fact that we're looking at the impact on families and then the impact on providers of these particular services. and. I don't like the fact that we're only looking at that for children. That's my only editorial comment. Elders, <laughs> older Vermonters oh. and people with disabilities have the same exact impacts that so, will be experienced. And I know there's a potential amendment. Yeah, that's that's something that's being discussed in yeah. next door uh, this week is, is how to address that because that's been a consistent concern that's been brought to the committee's attention. So. Until she brought that up, I thought we could solve it with the appropriate quadratic equation. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought you were much more of a mathematician than I was. Not the mathematician, and the physicist. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, okay. Clear as mud. Um, can, can you see if, um, she oh, she came hall. in. She was in the hall. Yeah. Oh, no. she, can I, but while we're waiting to get there, can I just mention another thing other than the DNA that is concerning to me that I don't know if anyone's thought of, but yesterday I toured a child care center, um, and they don't offer health care benefits, so all of their employees are on Health Connect. And when you switch from a 28-day to a 31-day, just that little bit of a switch meant four hours different for one of the younger employees there. And that means that that person spent the last four months fighting with Health Connect because they just went over and they wanted the full pay for their um, premium. And so to me, you guys should also be in the healthcare room saying, what are we going to do about it? Because this will have an impact on those folks, I mean, all those people who are on the edge as far as getting their health care covered um, through Health Connect, their health insurance. And it's worrisome um, because this young woman was. And she said her parents live in Massachusetts, and if she hadn't figured this out, she'd already told the child care center she was leaving. And the child care center has been paying to help her go to school, but they didn't realize that this would happen like that. And so I now, think, all of a sudden, when you I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Is that you have to be if you make a little yeah. amount of money, just like anything else, you um, you qualify for Health Connect. For free, so you get your insurance. You get subsidized, yeah. Right. Okay. Subsidized. So what? What is and the? And she went over because they stopped counting twenty-eight day hours to thirty-one day to a thirty-one day month instead of a twenty-eight. In this month. bill? No. But what I'm saying is, if that little bit of a change made that kind of an impact for this young woman, imagine what the change in the minimum wage will have. This is a much bigger difference. And so I'm just concerned that when you just brought up the aging group and all of that, it made me immediately think of this woman yesterday and how just like for childcare benefits, they could go over by just that little change, the same thing with their health benefits. They could lose those as well. Are you, are you saying because her wages went up on months that were 31 days versus yes. 28 days? Okay. Yes, yeah. so they wanted her to pay for those months, which okay. seems I and one thing that you might want to take a look at, um, and I'm not saying that this solves the issue, but it does put it in a easier to digest graphical, so you can kind of see what's happening to people as their wages go up. As Deb has these wonderful charts where she shows all the different forms of public assistance mm -hmm. that you can receive, 
and then as your wages go, go up, the public assistance goes down and the wages are supposed to compensate for it. When we did the minimum wage summer study a couple years back, the thing that they identified as the thing that sent people negative on that was the, the CCFAP benefit and the loss of that because that piled on top of everything else made it so that for each additional dollar earned, there was no, um, they, they weren't actually netting any money, they were actually losing money until they got out of that trough. Um, I'm singing the praises of your chart. Um, but it, it's, uh, there, there definitely are various points along the way where you'll either lose or see a decreased benefit, whether it's a subsidy for insurance or um, your, um, your uh, earned income tax credit or something okay. like that. And, and I'm going to cut this off yeah. because um, you're here in the building all the time. And, yeah, um, yeah. and, I, I, and we're going to change the subject and have you come in. Sure. You, we're, we know, we're, keep, we're, we're yeah. changing the subject from health care and everything else and asking you to come into the seat. Thank you. And um, I believe you understand our dilemma or our questions, which is we asked a child care bill that had changes in CCFAP and this. Yes, how does it fit in? That's in the S23. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think this is um, what Damien was talking about. <laughs> Yes? Okay, so this is an example of a, of a basic needs family, or actually it's 20 basic needs families. But um, You'll have to speak up because there are people here who can't hear so well. Sorry. Am I allowed to stand? We prefer not. <laughs> Sorry, because we let you stand, everyone else will be able to stand. So just use a really loud voice. Um, all right, so the basic needs budget um, set up a, a lot of different family types. This family type is two parents, two children. The children are a six-year-old who goes to school full-time <coughs> and needs childcare after school and full-time in the summer, and a four-year-old, and the four-year-old needs childcare full-time, um, but also gets universal pre-K, okay? and. They're lined up by their earnings, okay? And their earnings go from zero over here to 85,000, okay? And the height of the bar is showing you the resources that they, the family has available to it to meet its basic needs. The blue solid part is the net earnings, net of taxes. And then the other colors on top are the various benefits that they can also get to supplement. And so they are, um, the, this green, first green line has in it um, fuel assistance, reach up, health care. They're going from Medicaid on to the exchange, so it's public. Um, the next one, darker green, is food stamps. The blue one is various tax credits. And the purple one on the top is um, Child Care Financial Assistance Program. And it includes pre-K, so that's why it goes all the way up to the high income. That's the pre-K part of it. And so what you see is that as the family earns more, they, for a while, their resources available to make the basic needs goes up. And then at a certain point, it starts going down so that they take on a new job, earn more money, work more hours, and they actually end up worse off. And so right here, you have two parents both working at minimum wage in 2018, and then the minimum wage bill would move them from here to here, okay? And so you see that they're in the downslope area. So they started out here and they're moving down. And so, um, what S23 tried to do was to change the two basic parts of the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. The first is the provider fee, and they wanted to increase that and not, um, as a sort of assuming that it is at market rate, 
in the first place, which it isn't. But then they wanted to um, increase it by the amount that the child care workers' pay would go up because of the minimum wage change. Some child care workers um, now are getting paid less than what would be the equivalent of a $15 an hour minimum wage. So they would go up for that amount. <coughs> the second part of S23 is to change the sliding scale. And the sliding scale is the percentage of that amount that you would get. Um, and it depends on your income. And it would move it, um, it would move it to the right. So that, in other words, every time, it would just change those brackets. So let's just say the minimum wage bill increases the minimum wage by $5,000 over five years. And we'll say it does it equally. So every year, we change those brackets up $1,000. So that if you were at the 95th percentile before, you want to move those brackets up so that when your income goes up, you're still at the 95th percentile. So it does it little bit by little bit. So what is the breakdown of the money? I'm sorry, what's the what? What's the breakdown of the money? Because part of what we passed, and I'm not <coughs> aware of Oh, what it's we pretty passed. similar. Part, part of what we passed was dependent upon the money we had to work with. So. One of the things that we're interested in is how does this impact that money that we had appropriated? It was astoundingly similar. Um, and so I'll, I'll just show you the, um, this is what they did. Okay, so the gray bar on the top um, is added to the um, Chocolate Financial Assistance Program. And it at the low end, it's added because the, um, of the provider fee going up. And then in this valley, where you expect it to go down, it's actually going up for the two reasons. One is the provider fee's gone up, and the sliding scale has changed. This one is showing you yours. And I want to make sure that I did this one part right. I scaled when you got to 50%. Instead of dropping to 10, I went down to 45, 40. Mm -hmm. You want to do that? Okay. All right. And, you know, I had to sort of go between 100 and 95 by, like, whatever. But um, yours looks pretty similar. When I overlay the two, I was blown away, mm -hmm. like, at how close they are. Okay. Well, we knew that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. And Sorry. so here's the difference. Um, right around, so you go at 100%, um, after 100% federal poverty level, you go down to 95% at 125, and doing it the incremental way, keeping up with the, um, with the minimum wage change, it would stay at 100 to, to um, this point here, 125% of federal poverty level. It's teeny tiny dollar numbers difference, but to the people affected. You know, it's important. And then they're pretty much the same, but you, yours is more generous in this area, which is really important because it's in the valley. And, you know, it's where people are still losing. Um, and in terms of the money, it comes down to estimates. I actually estimated <coughs> higher costs for the um, <coughs> S23, even though it does But I, I imagine it's just an estimate here. I think that they're really close. The, so in terms of the, what they do and in terms of the money, they're like so similar I couldn't believe it. Um, the issue to me is like what happens if they both pass? Well, so the, the question, I mean, that's part of our question is that piece one, um, despite what happened in previous years, that piece in the minimum wage bill needs to get our okay. And never did. we have passed a minimum wage, and whether we, you know, go to the Senate and try to change things, or whether we go over across the way and go, you know, um, we spent, you, you, or is there is there something that needs both of us? I mean, you know, to have two things pass. So, if they, if they both passed, 
Well, I mean, we're trying to figure out what is the difference and then making an okay. assessment as okay. to what is the more appropriate in terms of the if, the, if the goal is, our goal is supporting child care. And when people do better, you know, to ensure that they still have um, available, um, affordable child care. And that is what we try to do. If what is in there is a better way of doing it, then we'll talk about that. If what we passed is a better way of doing it, and it comes to basically the same thing. I mean, right. we're trying to understand the interplay. Okay. And so I think the big difference is that you do it in a big jump. And the ways the, the bill that goes with the minimum wage goes step by step by step. In other words, it does. That it gets to that red line in five years. Oh, and we do it. Because next year. And we do it next year. Yeah. Yes. So but so what would happen is yours would benefit more people immediately because it would happen in the first year, but theirs is pegged to the changes in the minimum wage. So that when somebody in, gets an increase in the minimum wage, you know, they're um, they're held harmless essentially. But it also means that there's income coming in each year because the minimum wage brings in more income because people pay more in taxes and because they don't need Medicare and you know they, whatever Medicaid. Uh, yes, Medicaid. Okay, thank you. They've moved up Medicaid and um, anyway. So in a sense that it can pay for itself step by step by step. Um, but the other difference is that it. If this were passed all in the first year, and then in the second year we didn't also have an incremental change, then it would be then the minimum wage workers okay. would go backwards. Um, I'm not. I guess I'm not clear as to what you're saying. We're not saying don't. I mean, we're not making any comment on the rest of the minimum wage bill. Yeah. That this part in terms of how. Those, those two paragraphs in the minimum wage bill in terms of fussing with um, the child care, CCFAP. What I just heard you say is that what is in H531, in fact, makes it, it is a stronger benefit for families right now. Are you? Are you suggesting that in the out years it is a less strong? No. Okay. I'm just suggesting it's more of a problem for the, it's more of a work disincentive for the um, people getting a minimum wage increase. In other words, because it's going to have it all in one year and then it's not going to be moved so that somebody will end up Somebody will end up, instead of being here, they'll end up here, but then it's not going to change. So the next time, the next minimum wage. Um, so they wouldn't be worse off as the minimum wage changes up to $15. After $15, that's anybody's guess. Yeah. Um, but this is also, 531, the, the resources that are in 531 right now are year one of a multi-year improvement effort for a program that will essentially, I believe, if the numbers were right, will almost virtually eliminate that dip um, as we move out. So um, I, I don't, this is just my, the first blush of it, but it seems like 531 is a better for families than the language that's in S23. Mm -hmm. Even though I understand what you're saying, there, there is a s small space there um, at the, just as it starts to take that little dip where there are some families who might not be as well off as some of those other families. But what you were pointing out in that. Yeah. 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 Sandy. So I just want to clarify, so your line at the top is, is S23 in five years? Yes. Yes. So actually, I can put you know four different mm -hmm. lines in or whatever to, to get to that point. 
car. I hate to be so ignorant, but I'm looking at S23. Is that synonymous with the minimum wage bill? Or is there an amendment to the, the bill? It is to synonymous with what is it's synonymous with what is sitting across the hall right now and they're discussing. Next term. Term. So it is the minimum wage mm -hmm. bill. Right, it is okay. what is it's and have a paragraph in there to try to alleviate this problem with right. the child care situation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. And, and Teresa is saying that she thinks five thirty one by itself is better than that paragraph trying to right. fix it. Right. Okay. That's just and how, what do you, what demonstrates that to you in the visual? Right there? You see the red line? Yeah. Okay, that red line is after five years. You see the pink area? Yeah. That's next year. So we, in, in 531, we've raised families' they're status. Already above, they're already above that level. They, they will get that increase, mm -hmm. right. increase in, in being better off, as uh, financially better off, in one year as opposed to taking five years. Right. And in places it's higher. And in places it's higher. Right, where it peaks. And what, I'm sorry. And in, in, in that little valley, you can yes. see our, yes. the, our bill is not only comparable, but uh, brings families up. Yeah, less of a cliff. Yeah, right. yeah. You can't, you can't really call that a cliff after 531. Right. Right. In, right. in all reality. I mean, I could. Some people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I should speak for myself. I it's could. a bunny slope. It's a bunny slope. <laughs> <laughs> It is a bunny slow. <laughs> but then it goes back up again. Mm -hmm. but so if they both passed, um, yeah, that would be the nice. Um, I want to say that they're both not going to pass in the same way. This is why you are here. This is yes. why you are having this discussion. So that there is not a dueling responses to something that this that is the response that that there's not dueling responses. Right. I mean but the whether this may be impossible, but the best in my book, the best solution would be if we first went to five thirty one and then in the subsequent years we did a five year increment. The way that they're doing it in S twenty three with the money from the um, minimum wage. So it's just, it would start with 531 and then it would just move with the same sort of logic by filling in that valley over five years. And, uh, I, I like have, you see, have you seen the, the multi-year CPAP proposal? Yes. So did you, did you draft that? Um, I haven't drafted, it, but I think one of the um, one of the really important things about that is um, thinking about. So right now we have a sliding scale, and it's pretty much always been based on getting from 100 to zero in X amount of time. That's sort of been a straight line. And if the way that um, we're thinking longer term is turning it around and looking at not as a way to phase out the subsidy, but rather a way to phase in the copay in a way that makes sense for families. Um, I think that's huge progress, and I think that's part of the part of the proposal. And I realize that these are all interim steps, um, so we're not perfecting it in any of these proposals. But well, clearly we're going to have, need to have more conversation, and I'm really sorry that, that these conversations took place separately, mm -hmm. and that um, the goals are separate, and I sort of can't believe that this is happening when we all work for the same state. Um, and let's come back to it in terms of um, where we're going. And Reva, I guess I would like you and um, Deb to sit down. I mean, Deb is making some um, statements that I don't know whether you would agree or not agree with in terms of what the goals are and what can happen, and um, so that we can. I mean, we, and what we may be facing with is that there are, there are very different goals next door than there are here, and it's too bad we didn't 
know that ahead of time. And maybe we can find our way around that. So we'll take this up again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We have those graphs up on here. They're, they're on our webpage. They're on, they're, um, they're on our webpage, so we can look at that. Thank you. tomorrow at 3 or so or something. We have the um, hearing at 5. Um, please know that the, um, the information that I have said to both Guy Page and that has been also translated to Mary Hunt Ber Bearsworth is that um, he sh you know, that um, as I said, I expect people to act as if they were in church. Um, that um, displays the actions that will indicate support or opposition to what someone is saying when they testify are not allowed, are not within the decorum of the house. If you're coming in with pink, blue, purple sweatshirts or buttons, that's a whole different thing. Um, but uh, there was an incident, there was a controversy in the gun hearing around waving of the American flag at certain times during the um, testimony. Um, and so um, we are not, um, the message that I'm giving people is that displays of things that during one person's testimony to indicate support or opposition are not within the decorum of an open hearing. And no signs or posters. I oh, all right. No, I mean, no signs or posters. Yeah. I mean, I said that before. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, and just like people have flags on their table in the say, well, that's they have flags on their table. I mean, on your thing, but people don't wave the flag when, mm -hmm. when the vote is supportive of what they want, nor do they, you know. So that's, so I just want, and folks, if there is anyone who thinks that that really, I am really off base, I would like you to please um, talk with me about that. Um, but that is what I will be, um, I mean, this is really just to maintain a respectful, um, setting. Um, I don't think there'll be as many people as there were last time. There were people last time who um, were very concerned about not the well of the house, but room 11 where the overflow was. And there were people um, who, who were upset that they couldn't hear and they thought <coughs> that was on purpose. And they um, accused me and the um, sound people of turning the sound off when certain groups were testifying. Um, and then there were others who hold a different perspective who felt unsafe because of all of the um, um, outward displays of um, support or not support for when people are saying. So I'm just trying to make a setting where everyone feels comfortable no matter what they are saying about Proposition um, 5 that they feel safe and okay to say their piece. Um, because that's what we're here. We're here to listen to them and to hear. And I don't want folks to, to feel like it's not safe. In the wake of the gun hearing, I got calls from two constituents who, one was a couple here who um, attended, another was a 15-year-old young woman who testified, and they both were um, surrounded out in the parking lot afterwards and I was going to go talk to the I just heard about this this weekend I was going to go talk but I um, I also wanted to um, express to the Capitol Police if there could be a little more presence outside I mean I don't think that we'll have that issue with this group but no, I don't I, either but I do think it's you know something it's another issue when we get that group together 
it does tend to get really popular. All right. So. Thank you. And I understand that there is um, children, no, they're youth, out in, in um, oh, right. well, yeah. state colleges. The state colleges are um, in the cafeteria or something like that. I have an answer to your question. Oh, which question? The question about uh, the, I have um, lots. The, the, uh, high, the education investment plan. So two years ago, we put a question on our application asking if someone um, had invested in a, in, a, in a child education account, such as Vermont Higher Education Investment Plan, anything that qualifies. And if they say yes, we deduct what they tell us from their monthly income. Three people have marked yes in two years. So that's the take up. Is, uh, we've had three. The other policy change, though, that is a little bit helpful is if people get a raise within their 12-month eligibility period, um, their, uh, their financial assistance does not change for the entire 12 months. If they lose income so they go backwards, we reconfigure right away and have them pay less. But they are guaranteed the same for 12 months. So we've had three people take it up. So do you publicize when I, when I sign up, and so, so, you know, I filled out my thing and I said, no, I don't have the uh, Do you tell me, by the way, if you get a raise, see us about that? I'll check if the, um, if the eligibility specialists do that. They're, they, they are community people and they're generally pretty helpful in trying to maximize benefit for families, but I'll, I'll mention that to Anne. We can even send something out reminding them. Thanks. Okay, thank you. See you all. Tomorrow.